calling to order this meeting um, of the City Council. Um, before we begin, I would like to welcome our newest City Councilor, Stormy Fort. Um, Stormy, welcome. Um, I know this isn't the most traditional way to join a council through a virtual meeting, but we're very happy to have you um, with us and we look forward to working with you and also seeing the great things you do to represent your district. So, um, so welcome, warm welcomes. I'd send you a hug, but can't do that right now. So, and then you may notice that I have on my Panthers jersey. Well, you're probably wondering why, and you're gonna find out later in this meeting. I will tell you, it's really good news. Very exciting. So we are going to deal with the consent agenda first. Um, I have, um, Councillor Cox has pulled eight items, J1 through J8. So we'll pull that, but I will take um, a motion to approve um, the remaining items. Raise your hand um, to make a motion. Let I'd like to make a motion to approve the remaining items. Move for approval of consent agenda. That was Mayor Pro Tem. Do I have a second? Councillor Stewart, second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, and opposed. Okay. That was unanimous, Clerk. Um, now we have the um, items that you have pulled, Councillor Cox. Yes, I just wanted to get an update on these items. Uh, there, these are eight contracts. And I was wondering how many of them are going to uh, minority-owned or women-owned businesses. And, um, and in general, I was wondering how we're doing uh, in engaging minority-owned and women-owned businesses uh, with our contract services. Um, city Manager? Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, I, I don't know the specifics on each one of these eight contracts. Uh, the city's current policy for professional services encourage the use of MWBE contracts um, whenever possible. The procurement process uses a most qualified firm. You may recall that on several other items, you see a 15% goal that's on construction contracts. Um, but uh, as you saw earlier today from the Office of Equity and Inclusion, there's an MWBE group that works and advocates for that. Um, what I would suggest in terms of using our time wisely is maybe we can include the answer, a more thoughtful answer to that question for your September 8th work session topic on the disparity study. You remember you asked for that as a part of the budget process and it might be easier to wrap that into a general MWBE program update before you get to the disparity study just for the sake of, of time today. What, that's what I would suggest. Maybe we give you a more thoughtful um, response at that work session on September 8th. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That That is exactly what I think uh, we should be doing. And then we can look into this in more detail. And, and if we could get some data, uh, statistics about uh, not only with construction, but with all of our services that we contract, um, that would be great. Yes, we're happy to, to provide that. It's something that um, we're working on really hard. I know we know it's a priority of council, and that was one of the reasons that we re restructured that Office of Equity Inclusion to try to do to do more on that topic. So we'd be happy to include that. Okay, thank you. So uh, I, I move that we approve uh, these eight items. Do I have a second? I'll second. You're muted. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not muted. Oh, I was, yeah, I was muted. I wanted to second it, but I also want to thank Ruffin for having that work session that we've been asking for on the disparity study as we can look at a deeper detail. But also I ask that any of the businesses, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses continue to submit for and, and, and reach out to our city staff on opportunities to provide services. Um, so as we reach out, we we'll ask that you all continue to reach out as well. And if anyone has any issues or challenges, please feel free to contact m me and my office, and we'll definitely pass that information along. Okay, and thank again, you. I second the motion. Seconded that motion. All right. Um, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, no opposed. Clerk, that was unanimous. 
Um, next, we are going to have public comment. I'm going to remind um, our speakers of the rules of decorum. Um, each speaker will have three minutes. No profanity, cannot relinquish your time to another speaker, and please be kind. We have um, first on the list, Tammy Purdue. Give me one second to unmute her mayor, and I think the council um, chambers needs to turn on their camera and show the. Yes. And sorry, what was the name again? Um, Tammy Purdue. Thank you. We do have her. Do we have the three minute clock down up and running? This is when we need to I think I'm unmuted, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tammy, you are unmuted right now. We're just trying to get the clock straight. Okay. Okay, we need the clock running. Um, Beth, if we could have our first speaker. Yes, Mayor. Go ahead, Tammy. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today before Council on the importance of urban agriculture and community gardens in Raleigh. My name is Tammy Perdue, and I live at 1321 Athens Drive, also known as the Well-Fed Community Garden. After a long process to achieve our community garden special use permit in 2013, the Well-Fed Community Garden had been growing organic produce and distributing 20% of it to its neighbors and volunteers, while selling 20%, I mean 80% of the produce to the Irregardless Cafe. At the end of 2019, the majority owners of the Well-Fed Garden, Arthur and Anya Gordon, sold the Irregardless Cafe and began running the Well-Fed Community Garden to me, a farmer. We are requesting your assistance as council to achieve our goal of opening a produce stand to sell our produce directly from the garden. The sales of our organic produce to neighbors will support the health of the community and earn uh, income uh, for us to train new urban farmers. Currently, the Raleigh UDO does not support the needs of our community garden or any community garden to open a produce stand. The UDO needs to change to allow produce stands at community gardens and to modify the type of street where a produce stand is allowed to occur as the current regulation is limited only to major streets. In addition to the request for assistance with our produce stand, we'd like to point out that our community garden continues to experience issues with complying to outdated zoning ordinances that have no consideration for urban agriculture. We have repeatedly attempted to resolve these issues through permitting, but continue to have issues with the permitting department requesting documentation of even the most basic farm equipment, such as the hoop house over our field. We are asking for your assistance because Raleigh needs to prioritize urban agriculture. A 2011 city staff report encouraged both urban agriculture and community gardens, but the new UDO, when adopted, sidestepped some of the most important details of urban ag practices and structures that should be allowed as part of operations. The 2030 strategic plan encourages urban agriculture as part of the desire for safe, vibrant, and healthy communities, but in our experience, finding the acceptance from the city for the basic needs of a successful community garden venture is onerous and unsupportive. 
In light of the COVID pandemic and the realization of many community members that our food supply chains need to be more resilient and more localized, I would hope that the City Council would find time to help us with an immediate need of opening a produce stand to serve the community. And with the long-term goal of more supportive regulation of all, city, all the city's beautiful urban farms and community gardens. To summarize, we request the following considerations from council. During this time of public health and economic crisis due to COVID, waive the location limitations on produce stands so that any community garden, including our own, can open produce stands to, to feed our communities. And number two, start the process for staff to do a detailed comprehensive amendment to the urban agriculture zoning ordinance using the city's current thriving urban ag businesses for support. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Um, I remember looking at this issue of produce stands um, way back in the days of the Law and Public Safety Committee. Um, and we did change some rules to allow that. It looks like we need to update um, some of our statutes. So I would ask um, our city manager to sign this appropriately and um, have staff come back to us with more information on how we could move forward. Uh, Mayor, we can certainly do that. We're happy to provide you a report. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Deborah Newton. I'm Deb Newton, a criminal defense attorney and Raleigh resident for 35 years. I address comments to Mayor Baldwin, Police Chief Deck Brown, and Deputy Galloway regarding the stand down order for Raleigh PD on 2 July. Citizens and businesses rely on law enforcement to protect and serve. In such reliance, citizens do not prepare to personally fight criminal conduct. That contract between the city and her citizens ensures peace and confidence and security. For 30 years, we had in reliance on that peace and security brought downtown Raleigh from an abandoned venue in the evenings to a vibrant city by investing our money, time, and energy to open businesses and invest in homes to move our families here. It took one summer to destroy that confidence by you ordering police to stand down when mobs intent on violence and property destruction focused on Raleigh. Citizens were harmed. Businesses in our beautiful courts were shuttered. When on 2 July, I, along with others, were held against our will on the public street, fearing the violence and crime we'd witnessed in other situations, I requested help of Raleigh PD and Capitol Police standing by for a full five minutes and was denied. We now know they were ordered to do so. My, since my refusal to obey lawless force, many have expressed their concerns. I quote from law enforcement, the protests dragged on and there seemed to be no clear direction from city leaders on what the approach was. This was a big moral issue among the officers. The stand down order was part of the issue. The officers felt like the protesters had their way throughout the city and the police could do nothing about it. Neighbors, we're worried if we call the police, they won't respond. If we stop are stopped on Capitol Boulevard and call 911, they won't come again. If we drive to downtown Raleigh our small, with our small children, we're not safe. From a detective, protesters have the right to protest, but there's a very real difference between protesters and a mob. We need legislation that will address the aggressive and damaging behavior the citizens and business owners suffered at the hands of this very uncivil and well-organized mob. And finally, a neighbor. As an African-American woman, I support the peaceful protest. The protest does not advocate violence or harassment of innocent citizens. I was deeply upset and furious for my neighbor, Deb Newton, who was met with such harassment. Police officers took an oath to protect and serve. Taxpayers support officers to be there when we need them. Will this be, will Raleigh be the next Portland or Seattle? If the mayor and officials have lost sight of what it means to, to protect and serve everyone, they should be removed from their position. I do not want to live in fear. For the sake of our community and those living in it, give police their authority to protect and serve. Citizens who stop me walking my dogs want to know, will please protect them? Stand down orders are a violation of your oath and responsibility to serve the city and protect it. If you disagree, your duty is to resign. Fine officers who put their life at risk should not be placed in jeopardy of their job or doing, for doing their job we expect of them. They do not deserve humiliation and demoralization for their sacrifices and honor. We must pass legislation to ensure fair treatment of all citizens and enforce the law to ensure justice, rule of law, and the liberty for all citizens. As a lawyer, I recognize my personal responsibility to help our fractured city. In closing, I want to thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, city Manager, I'm going to ask you to um, respond to this to us in the manager's report, if you wouldn't mind. 
Uh, we certainly can do that, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Richard Johnson. 3225 Oak, Richard Johnson, 3225 Oak Grove Circle. Recently, a local free tabloid that endorsed all of you except David Cox ran an article about fake progressives. They operated a local restaurant and bar while all the time having a culture of toxic sexual harassment and abuse. I had actually thought an article about fake progressives would be about Mayor Baldwin and the majority of this council. Since you present yourself as progressives, but act, govern, and vote like right-wing Republicans. Mayor Baldwin likes to say Senator George McGovern was her inspiration for being in politics. He was also a political hero to me. Senator McGovern believed in inclusion. He would never have voted in a sneak attack like the one led by Sage Martin and Nicole Stewart to abolish Raleigh CACs with zero public input or notice. Senator McGovern was a very moral person. Mayor Baldwin burrs the line between being mayor of all of Raleigh and her full-time job for Barnhill Contracting, a job she took only a few weeks after voting to give them another multi-million dollar city contract. Senator McGovern was a protector of the land to pass down to future generations. Mayor Baldwin is a relentless supporter of the Wakestone RDU quarry. Her example is more like Donald Trump than Senator George McGovern. Speaking of fake progressives, Council's two self-proclaimed environmentalists are anything but environmentalists. Nicole Stewart and David Knight have constantly worked to be sure the giant quarry at Umstead Park will become a reality for Wake Stone. This giant, ugly quarry will be a sore on our area for years to come. David Knight said he sent a strongly worded letter to DEQ as a private citizen, but has nothing, done nothing as a counselor. He actually said a strongly worded letter. That would be laughable if it wasn't so serious. Guess he has to dance to the tune of the builders and developers who financed 79% of his campaign. Look it up. As for Nicole Stewart, she seems to think being an at-large counselor means representing Wakestone, John Kane, builders and developers, and any place there's a trophy brewery. She's been missing in action since day one on the con quarry controversy. She has done nothing, zero, zilch to help stop this quarry. If she wants to be considered an environment, environmentalist, she needs to walk the walk, not just talk. Shame on you both. Next, we have Chantille Miles. Yes, my name is Chantel Miles, and I live at 3408 Sioux Drive here in Raleigh. I am speaking today to hopefully remind you, or at least inform you, Raleigh City Council, of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals binding decision in Davidson versus Randall and how it relates to the First Amendment. Before I speak on council members' violations of citizens' First Amendment rights, specifically my First Amendment rights, I want to say that it is frustrating as an ordinary citizen that I have to bring to your attention the preciousness of our right of freedom of speech. It is a core value upon which our imperfect nation was founded in 1776. And yet I, and I know of others, still have to fight to protect this right from infringement by this city council in 2020, nearly 250 years later. The Fourth Circuit's decision in Davidson versus Randall was unanimous, and it ruled that it is unlawful for public officials to exclude people based on their viewpoints from social media used in an official capacity to communicate with the public. To do so is a violation of the First Amendment right of free speech. Patrick Bufkin is my representative, and he recently blocked me from the Twitter account that he uses as an elected official to communicate with the public. And he further disabled my ability to comment on his Facebook posts, along with deleting all of my comments. To be clear, Patrick Bufkin uses both of these accounts as an elected official and not for personal use. And his blocking of me on social media violated my First Amendment right to free speech, just as was in the case 
in Davidson versus Randall. It is important to note that not only is Patrick Bufkin my city council representative, but he is also a practicing attorney. When he violated the law by blocking me on social media, he also failed to uphold the North Carolina rules of professional conduct to which North Carolina attorneys are beholden. Comment seven to the rule 8.4 states, lawyers holding public office assume legal responsibilities beyond those of other citizens. A lawyer's abuse of public office can suggest an inability to fulfill the professional role of lawyers. So today, on August 18th, 2020, I am asking you, Patrick Bufkin, to please abide by the law. You are a practicing attorney, and more importantly, my elected representative on city council. Do what's right and lawful, and immediately unblock me from the Facebook and Twitter accounts you use to communicate with the public as an elected official. Thank you. Next, we have Tim Niles. Councilors Melton and Bufkin, you justified your vote to upzone property at Shelley Lake by telling citizens protective conditions were offered by the developer. Councilor Melton, you said they offered certain conditions to protect the park, such as a 200 plus foot tree buffer. Councilor Bufkin, you said there will be a 215 foot setback on the back of the property. We know this message got through because your supporters repeated it on social media in your defense. The actual language of the condition states, there shall be no principal building located within 215 feet of the Shelley Lake property. Principal building being the operative phrase. City officials have confirmed this allows parking lots, parking structures, dumpster enclosures, leasing offices, clubhouses, pool houses, maintenance buildings, all within the 215 feet anything except residential condos, which are the principal buildings. As lawyers, you should have understood this language. Principal building doesn't seem that complicated. More shocking, council received an email from a forestry expert detailing concerns about this condition. Do these counselors not understand conditional zoning? It's a large part of their responsibility. Didn't they read the email they received from a forestry expert? Engagement with the community means reading your mail. Or were they in on this con job from the beginning just hoping no one would notice? You both owe the citizens an explanation and an apology for your deception. Amazingly, the media is not holding these two accountable for lying. Where are you, NNO, Indie Week, WRAL? It's your job to hold their feet to the fire, not to provide cover for them. Don't you care that they deceived the residents of Raleigh? You went crazy reporting the last council for changing the rules of decorum that didn't stop anyone from speaking. Now you say nothing when this council eliminates freedom of speech, freedom of association, and the right to assemble by banning developers from meeting with CACs. Is it just the fact that you endorsed the, this majority? Do better, media. And Mary Ann Baldwin, you also violate the, the uh, same rules Chantel just mentioned you had me blocked on Twitter for years time to unblock thank you next we have Steph Mendel recently an email was sent to a local Yimby email group alleging that quote fake CACs were pressuring developers to come to their sham meetings in violation of the city council directive that abolished CACs back in February in a surprise attack without any public engagement. This, this man said that if developers did not, did not attend, they would face repercussions. What repercussions a group of Raleigh residents could impose on a developer is not clear to me. However, some developers apparently are citing the language from that council motion to excuse themselves from interacting with CACs because they don't want to violate the law. It's unclear to me why a responsible civic minded developer wouldn't want to engage with the public to garner support for their plans, unless their plans were likely to have a detrimental impact on the community. This council, as I'm sure you will agree, does not have the power to infringe upon First Amendment rights 
of Raleigh residents or developers to meet together and work to understand proposed changes to a neighborhood and to collaborate to ensure a win-win for both the developer and the community. I'm sure you want to correct this misapprehension and clarify that you actually encourage engagement between developers and residents in the best interests of growing Raleigh responsibly and equitably. Otherwise, it will be difficult to understand what purpose was served in abolishing the CACs other than to clear a path for uncontrolled development without any input from residents. And I'd actually like a response to my, uh, my remarks here, to Chantel's remarks, to Tim's remarks, to Richard's remarks. Um, you know, the first two speakers both got, oh, we'll have a staff report on that. The rest of us are being ignored. You give a lot of lip service to engagement, but you people do not engage. You don't answer emails from your constituents. Nicole did a survey about engagement and never, never published the results. One man has asked her repeatedly for information about how much it costs to run the CACs, and she keeps saying she's going to give that information to him, but she never has. Another gentleman I know wrote to several of you on council and asked a lot of questions about ADUs. He never got an answer. If you want to improve engagement, you need to start walking the talk. You need to engage with your constituents. Um, hiring consultants to help you learn how to engage is not the answer. It starts with you. So do a better job. Okay, next we have Johnny Hackett. Hey, good afternoon, Mayor Baldwin, Mayor Pro Tem Branch, uh, and fellow council members. My name is Johnny Hackett, and I reside, reside at 7301 Stone Cliff Drive, Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm the founder and CEO of Black Dollar and C, which is a Raleigh-based organization that was established in February 2019 to focus on the support and success of Black-owned businesses. While our membership is comprised of business owners across North Carolina, 620 to date, more than half our members call Raleigh home, numbering 331. It's great to be here with you all today, and I want to first thank you all for your leadership. I know how important supporting our small businesses is to this council, and after talking with Raleigh, City of Raleigh staff, I felt it best to come to you all directly to seek council support for our weekend community workout program that is aimed at providing such support to business owners in Raleigh. The program is designed to raise funds for Raleigh area gyms, fitness studios, and fitness instructors who remain closed during COVID-19 health concerns and provides a healthy option for no more than 20 people at a time to come together in support of our Raleigh community, keeping the awareness of fitness and mental wellness at the forefront during these unprecedented times. You may remember Councilwoman Stewart and Mayor Pro Tem Brand sharing in April how Black Dollar NC raised more than $5,000 in establishing a groomers fund to support Raleigh Barbers, stylists, and nail techs. We've also implemented online QVC type streaming programs to give selling opportunities to entrepreneurs, provide a free face mask to essential workers. And we have a current initiative underway where we partner with a few NC State students to provide over $7,000 in relief to businesses with damages located in downtown Raleigh. Building upon these initiatives, our focus now is to provide support to Raleigh gym and fitness industry. Partnering with Moore Square, Parks and Rec, Black Flea Market and C, the Office of Economic Development and Innovation, and some of our alliance partners, such as Shop Local Raleigh, DRA, and Cameron Village, we have secured Moore Square for the weekend of September 5th and 6th through a collaboration with the annual African American Festival Board. The program will offer hour-long workouts throughout the day, where we have a variety of Raleigh fitness instructors lead the workout sessions. For example, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., there will be a yoga session led by a particular instructor. 11 to 12 will be a Zumba session led by another instructor, so on and so forth. Each participant in the workout will be asked to donate a $20 to $25 participant fee, of which all money will be provided to business owners in the Raleigh gym and fitness industry. Because of the need and interest of this program, projections have exceeded $10,000 for the weekend, which is never enough, but every little bit helps and would certainly be valued to those business owners. Understandably, the council may have concerns about this program. However, I want to assure you that this program has been planned and created within Governor Cooper's current phase two guidelines. We're actually very grateful to have guidelines during this time, helping us to understand what we can and cannot implement with regard to special programs or events. And even within that, we still move cautiously. Section eight sets limits at no more than 25 outdoors. However, however this program is, has currently set limits at no more than 20 uh, per class. Uh, Section 9 of Governor Cooper's order with regard to the governing of sporting events also provides us with additional flexibility as long as requirements with on-site screening and other sanitation agendas uh, during operations can be followed. 
Our partners at Moore Square will be valuable in helping us achieve this, a safe and within the guidelines in-person program. Our partners, business owners, and community members are, in general are excited about this program. Uh, and our mission here today was communication uh, and to ask uh, of the council uh, after thoughtful consideration to provide us with an approval uh, for us and our partners to implement this program on September 5th and 6th. Uh, we welcome any feedback that you may have, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions or concerns you may have. Uh, thank you for the time. Okay, can somebody from staff give some on this? And also, could people who are not speaking mute their phones? Thank you. Uh, Mayor, I, I'm not familiar with the specifics of this particular program, so I don't know if Derek Reamer or Oscar Car uh, Carmona is, is in the virtual uh, meeting room and can come forward. I'm gonna guess that the issue is the city uh, helping to sponsor or approve of an event that will represent a gathering, which is why it's probably coming in front of you. We, we generally have taken an approach of uh, not using that approach, but obviously this is also an interest in helping out your small business. Okay, so Mr. Carmona is here and can perhaps help shed some light, thank you. Yes, uh, that is correct, uh, Mayor Baldwin and members of Council Officer Carmona, Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources. At this time, we're not uh, uh, doing any special events or rentals on any of our park sites. Thus, uh, we were not able to uh, permit uh, Mr. Hackett's um, program. So uh, we referred him to uh, address it to Council to see if they would be willing to waive uh, the requirements at this time. Mayor, if I could add then, so the, the issue then, of course, the issue is um, there are lots and lots of events that uh, currently wish to use park space and, and prior, you know, pre-COVID, our parks are robustly used all the time for gathering events outside. So um, obviously the, the purpose of the event is uh, quite appropriate, quite uh, something that the council would likely support. Our only caution would be making an exception for one group will likely result in appeals from other groups who would like to do the same thing. That's And that's the issue. It sets a precedent. Yes, which is why we were, according to Oscar, uh, un, unable to approve one group over another, as, as wonderful as the approach and, and the, the purpose may be. Is there a private, um facility where this could be held outdoors? Or have we offered any guidance in that regard? Uh, no, we have not. Um, I did ask Mr. Hackett if he had possibly reached out to any other private locations, but uh, we hadn't gotten to that point yet. M Madam Mayor, if, if I may, I understand the issue and the precedence here. So if I can, um, I, I, let me work with Mr. Hatchett. Maybe there's some opportunities working with some private um, groups that can offer some space. Um, I understand really the issue here is, because I feel he can meet our, the governor's guidelines. I believe he can meet those guidelines. What we're coming down to here is really a standard and a precedence um, that impacts multiple groups and organizations. So if council's okay, um, let me just work with Mr. Hatchett um, and figure out what we can do so that we can do something to help our um, businesses in the community. Okay, um, that sounds great. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, thank you. And um, Mr. Hackett, if you're listening, um, Councilor Branch will be in touch with you. We certainly support the effort and the intent of this program, but have concerns about um, the precedent it would send. So Council Branch, thank you for moving forward with that. Okay. Next yeah, comment on this. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Councillor Cox. Um, I was wondering, Mr. Manager, if we could look into some options uh, where we could identify what kinds of capacity we would have for activities such as this. And once we understand the capacity, 
maybe we could look into a process where we could have a lottery allowing um, different businesses to be able to apply for using that capacity, um, provided they you know meet the health guidelines. And uh, if you could bring that back as well, that would be useful. I think. Uh, certainly, Mr. Cox, we'll be happy to write write a report uh, and get that back to you, or write or give you some comments on that. What I would suggest is the scope of that is really two things. One is capacity, and the other is the the programmatic choice about what things to allow and not allow. So, for example, the current phase guidelines, which Mr. Hackett referenced, uh, say no more than 25 people outside gathered. And so we might have capacity for that, but then the question is, does the city sanction one, you know, one particular group or another? We can certainly look at that for some other kind of alternative permit, alternative exception process while we remain in the phase two period. Um, that's the balancing act because there's a there's a lot of groups that use a lot of our parks. So we, we can look at that and bring you something back in a report. Yeah, and, and if we have a, a huge demand, then maybe we could go to something like a lottery where we could, uh, you know, be able to allow people to use this capacity and and the end these resources. But and maybe a lottery, maybe some other process. But it seems to me a lottery might be the, the fair and equitable way to do it. Right. Uh, for us, we're also trying to reconcile the public message to the the to the city about the encouragement of the social distancing and not gathering and if we in, if we the one thing we have to pay attention to if we endorse a group and then visually we see there's a group gathering in a park that we sanctioned it could impact our message to other groups where we're trying to keep them from it so it's that's that's yeah, the absolutely, balancing act. absolutely yeah i mean that, that all needs to be considered yeah yeah well we will look at this topic and bring something back to you absolutely thank you okay thank you um, next, we have Mara DeCola. Thank you so much, Mayor Baldwin and City Council. My name is Mara DeCola, and I am the new executive director of the organization Cooperating Raleigh Colleges. I'm here today to bring visibility to the organization and to encourage collaborative efforts with the city. Next slide, please. We are the nonprofit consortium of the colleges here in the city of Raleigh. We coordinate collaborative efforts among our member institutions and the sharing of knowledge and resources among those who live in our community. Next slide, please. Our leadership includes a board comprised of the presidents, chancellor, and several senior level administrators from our member institutions. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Some of the projects we help tackle are cross registration for students to be able to attend classes at any CRC institution every semester. We are the administrators for the Raleigh Television Network's Channel 18 and the, uh, the city's Education Peg Channel. I help coordinate meetings and trainings for human resources offices, campus police offices, librarians, academic affairs offices, and many more. We also collaborate with city offices, such as the Ch City um, Chamber of Commerce, who works with our student governments, and the Raleigh Coll Intercollegiate Student Advisory Board. Next slide, please. In 2018, we um, conducted an economic impact study to see how our organization was helping impact the city of Raleigh. Local public revenues in Wake County and its municipalities derived from the total incomes generated by the institutions were estimated to be $180 million. And results indicated that our consortium made up 22% of all wage and salary income earned in the local economy and 40% of total employment in 2017. Next slide, please. Looking ahead, we would love to continue to have some more community involvement. Cooperating Raleigh Colleges hopes to continue to build relationships with businesses and organizations in the city. We hope to foster connections to help with internships, employment opportunities, resources needed for employees in a new city, community service opportunities, and our communities re meet regularly, and we invite the opportunity for our campuses to hear from you. If you have ideas for collaboration, want to share your expertise, or need assistance with a project, please see if um, if we can help connect you with the right people in CRC, please contact me at any time. I would love to continue to collaborate with the city. Next slide, please. And my email address is there. I appreciate your time and all of the work that you do with the city council. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Maura. Um, I appreciated being able to speak um, to your group um, regarding the reopening of campuses and some of the activities that we were doing as a city um, helping and assisting businesses. And my understanding is that those same um, services have been offered to all of you. And likewise, um, we, can t we look forward to continuing that um, relationship. Next, we have Catherine Bird. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. I have lived in Raleigh for the past seven years. I see that there is a proposed budget amendment of $230,000 to be used from the Controlled Substances Fund to lease police vehicles. According to the agenda, Contro controlled substance funds are proceeds from the North Carolina Unauthorized Substances Tax and may only be used for purposes that directly enhance law enforcement activities. I did not know that such a fund existed until I saw it on this agenda, and it does not sit well with me. I did some more research on this tax and it applies to substances like marijuana. According to the NC Department of Revenue website, 75% of the money collected is returned to the state or local law enforcement agency whose investigation led to the assessment. The remaining 25% of the money is credited to the general fund. It is well documented that black people and other people of color are disproportionately targeted in stop and search methods of policing. So it is particularly troubling that police have a direct incentive to profit by conducting racially targeted searches for controlled substances. And then in addition to whatever criminal pen penalty that person may face, there is a financial one as well with the tax. If the true goal of this tax was to actually help end substance abuse, why are those funds not directed to eradicating the causes of the problem? Things like reducing poverty, increasing health care, increasing educational opportunities, increasing job opportunities, or creating more affordable housing. By rewarding law enforcement instead, it just creates a vicious cycle. In fact, if the city and police department get such a large profit from this tax, looks like in 2019, the state of North Carolina got about 6.8 million, which is over 17 times the revenue from state taxes. I'm not sure how much of that Raleigh got. It seems to me that there is actually no incentive whatsoever to eliminate the use of these controlled substances in our communities. I'm concerned because this just seems to be a routine agenda item to allocate these $230,000 for police vehicles that will just get rubber stamp approved when there are many community organizations such as Raleigh Pact and Refund Raleigh calling to defund the police. Speaking of which, another troubling agenda item is Chief Deck Brown's proposal to create a police homelessness and mental health unit in which there are as many officers as there are social workers. While there's a great need in our city to address homelessness and mental health, these are not issues that should be handled by the police department. If this unit is in any way a response to recent protests and calls to defund the police, it is a clear sign that the demands of citizens and community leaders are not being heard, understood, or respected, because we're definitely not asking for more policing or police involvement in these issues. We're asking for investment in our communities. And so I ask you, members of City Council, Mayor Baldwin, with each decision you make, no matter how routine, are you working to actively dismantle systemic racism? Or are you upholding the status quo? Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mary Dolberg. Hi, yes. I am a resident of Raleigh, and I'm concerned about the um, lack of communication. You choose to communicate um, when you engage with folks that are in front of you, um, petitioning to speak with you, and it's something that interests you. You um, are fully there. You're asking questions. You're taking time to, um, you know, propose other things and, you know, other ways to deal with this and moving forward to deal with other groups, such as, you know, Mr. Hackett's proposal. Um, I like that, but I don't like the fact that you pick and choose and you may have to try and engage with folks who say something that you may not like, that you may make you feel uncomfortable. Um, yeah, that's just off the top of my head with this meeting. I am very concerned with the latest proposal, um, as the last speaker spoke about, to uh, create a special unit. You have consultants that you pay from everything for community engagement on one level, community engagement within the planning department, community engagement for other things, more consultants for more things. I don't think you've looked and um, spoken about a consultant for this special unit. And, um, you know, we have a, an organization called RTI International that has some many deep studies and suggestions on policing in the community. And I do not think that 
the special unit for homeless and mental health issues needs to come out of police funding. Um, take the money out of police funding and put it through something else uh, to deal with this. The police don't need to be dealing with the homeless and the mental health issues as a crisis unit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Carmen Cawthon. Good afternoon. My name is Carmen Cawthon. I reside at 703 Lattice Street. Um, I want to talk briefly about the public participation playbook that was discussed at today's work session. Um, on page six, there it mentions that there are certain organ or certain things that re don't receive federal funding and therefore are not required to comply with the federal engagement regulations. Um, I would hope that you would continue to engage the community publicly with those six project areas. On page 13, there's discussion about um, building community relationships, and I hope that those um, that you would all as a council recognize that you need to be building community relationships consistently, not just in the district that you are elected in, but citywide. Um, it is also on page 17 important for the council as a whole and individually to continue to work at building the trust factor throughout the city. That has um, been an issue over the years and has not necessarily gotten better. Um, and on page 18, it talks about community leaders and ambassadors. Um, I, I don't see that those ambassadors should be political appointments by the council because that will continue to lessen the trust factor that you are trying to build. Don't only speak with the usual and most respected leaders or gatekeepers, and I hate the word gatekeepers, um, in a community. Look for other groups or other people to speak with about issues that you don't, not, you don't normally hear from. Page 19 talks about advisory groups. Um, so what is the difference between the CACs and these advisory groups other than um, appointment for the advisory groups by the city council, which again, will make that a political um, kind of group. And on page 21, talks about com community profile. Um, who would be building a community profile? Will there be a different group created for each project that um, that is talked about through the council? Um, that seems um, it seems a little unwieldy for me, to me. Um, and on page 26, there's a box that talks about engaging diverse communities, but none of the engagement plans that are listed for pop-up events are targeted to, to engage black neighborhoods. And it's important that that be researched and included in this plan. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, look forward to hearing that some of these things will be addressed. Thank you. Next, we have Wanda Gilbert Coker. Hello. 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 Yes, my name is Wanda Gilbert Coker, and I am now a resident of Southeast Raleigh. I am a member of Raleigh PAC, Raleigh Demands Justice, and Wake County Housing Justice Coalition, and also the City of Raleigh Fair Housing Hearing Board. As someone who has experienced homelessness with a teenage daughter, I am proof that housing solves homelessness. Policing does not. My daughter and I are proof that low-income housing solves homelessness. Policing does not. We are proof that having access to mental health and service providers such as Alliance Behavioral Health, Wake Med, Rex and Duke Hospitals, Wake County Public School Systems, Faith-Based Organizations, Wake County Social Services, solves homelessness. Policing does not. Moreover, as a housing advocate and community activist, I have personally seen veteran resources, family unification, substance abuse intervention, hotel vouchers, rent and utility assistance, 
access to free bus passes, free and nutritious meals, gas vouchers, and access to sanitation and hygiene, solve and ease homeless issues. Effective Police Homeless Outreach realizes that permanently solving an issue also will result in reduced calls for services generated by high system, high system users. That getting people to move along solves nothing. It's just more displacing of people. Policing does not solve homelessness. Police contact can have con catastrophic catastrophic consequences for people experiencing homelessness. The issue, the issue of tickets can, for many people, produce hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in fines and court fees. Non-payment can result in arrest warrant. And arrest and incarceration can mean loss of important personal items, such as warm clothing, work tools and supplies, and life-sustaining medications, not to mention from um, separation from human and animal companions. Further, contact with the, with the criminal legal system can result in, crim in a criminal record that can prevent people from qualifying for housing. Thus, because housing is a human right, safe, affordable, sustainable housing can solve and ease mental health issues that the homeless and the most vulnerable population face. Not the uh, your, your time is up once. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Stephanie Lorman. My name is Stephanie Lorman. I'm at 2704 Ramsey Road. I'm here to speak about RPE's creation of a homelessness and mental health unit, specifically about why this so called liberal city council continues to view policing as a solution to anything especially since the start of the uprisings at the end of May. RPD and specific members of this council have a recent and disgusting history of interaction with our unhoused and or mentally ill neighbors. Since 2016, RPD has, by my count, shot five mentally ill people, three of whom were killed. They stood complicit as Mr. Hinton was mauled by a dog. Seven years ago this month, some will remember Biscuit Gate, when RPD began to disrupt a six-year tradition of community-led efforts to bring meals to our unhoused neighbors in Moore Square when they started threatening to arrest anyone handing out food. I volunteered with human beings at that time, so I had also heard stories from my neighbors about how RPD would skulk around in the days before large outdoor festivals like Brugaloo to arrest people for things like trespassing, public urination, and public intoxication. We get rounded up like they are emptying the city trash cans, one man told. In June 2015, community leaders outlined solutions and next steps for addressing the root causes of homelessness. Homelessness, No surprise, no one mentioned more cops. This entire summer, your community has shown up for public comments in the hundreds to tell you how we want our money spent in community services to our neighbors. No one mentioned cops. In fact, we explicitly said no more cops. You heard all of that and came back with a solution of more cops. The concept of RPD entering a tent village to provide relief to unhoused and or mentally ill folks is absurd beyond belief. How many people did RPD bring to the shelter? Are shelters even safe for people during the COVID pandemic? How will this unit interact with the unhoused folks forced to live in extended stay hotels? And how many people did RPD arrest for some outstanding warrant for a failure to appear, often for the oh so dangerous crime of trespass or loitering both of which are the expected consequences of folks not having a home. Your decisions as a governing body, your unwavering support for RPD's violence in the black and brown community, your refusal to act this summer as they and the LEOs they invited filled the streets with their tear gas, flashbang grenades, and rubber bullets, the city approved use of property liens and eminent domain to land that is then used to build apartments for the grandchildren of white folks that fled urban cities in the 60s and 70s, I am personally tired of waiting for history to judge the actions that protect racist institutions in service to white supremacy. We will never stop battering against your lacking political and moral will. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Hua Huang. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. 
My name is Hua Huang, 7401 Ebenezer Children Raleigh. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Wake County Housing Justice Coalition on the issue of affordable housing. The coalition has come to the council before expressing concern for the affordable housing bond. Main concern being that the bond's commitment for affordable housing has been vague and does not provide detail on the exact amount of money that will be designating to specifically address the needs of the people making 30% AMI or below. The number of people who will be making less than that will no doubt increase due to COVID-19, which is impacting our community far longer and more devastating than anyone anticipated, with 1,500 new cases and 30 new deaths in Wake County as of August 15th. While it is important to be able to pr protect businesses, more importantly, the city also needs to protect people who will lose their income, their livelihood, their homes. This pandemic will not only bring death, but also drive many into poverty and homelessness. This is also all the more reason why we need, need the city to make a strong commitment to build affordable housing for individuals making 30% AMI or below, rather than considering it as a mere afterthought. The coalition has approached the council before, stating that the city can take after Durham's comprehensive plan for affordable housing. I want to also bring to the city's attention of Durham's Racial Equity Task Force recommendation for reparation efforts for the Black community, among which include establishing transparency with people on information about developers, historical effects on housing prices and rents, and also tracking residents who are relocated due to redevelopment and find out how many of them did not manage to come back. These are all actions that indicate Durham's commitment to stop gentrification and hold developers accountable for whether they are giving back to the people or just furthering private gangs. I would like to see Raleigh commit to addressing the needs of the people, specifically the black and brown community with the same level of intent and attention to detail as Durham does. Right now, the city is taking on the proposal to address homelessness and mental health with a new police unit, the very thing that the city council proposed to do during their meeting with Raleigh Demands Justice on June 29th. These are public health issues, not police issues. The people do not need more law enforcement. They need affordable housing and detail of, and while detail on use of force incidents in North Carolina are apparently off limits to the public. I was able to learn that at least with LAPD, for example, one in three use of force incidents is on homelessness. What's Raleigh's record on use of force on their homelessness and mentally ill? Please establish a clear, strong commitment to allocate $80 million housing bond to address housing needs for 30% AMI or below, and please do not approve on this new police unit as a, police, as a city solution to address future homelessness issues. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Natalie Liu. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Natalie. My name is Natalie Liu, and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I would like to thank the individual Raleigh City Council members that submitted comments to NCDEQ opposing Wakestone Corporation's proposed private rock quarry that would be created on land deeded in part to the city of Raleigh. I would also like to thank the Raleigh City Council as a whole for submitting a public comment. It is very much appreciated. In my read of your comment, you simply asked NCDEQ to evaluate public comments. Have you read the 1800 comments? Have you taken to heart the huge public opposition to this quarry or the disastrous consequences that this quarry would bring? During this pandemic, with schooling and work now taking place from home, with public events being canceled for months to come, with gyms and activity centers being closed, with sports fields and playground features being closed or highly limited, our greenway system and open spaces have seen extremely high usage. More than ever, we need our forested recreation spaces. I work part-time in the outdoor recreation industry. The industry has seen a boom. Equipment for most outdoor activities is hard to come by these days because it is all sold out. In the cycling industry, many bikes are on back order for until the first of the year. When this pandemic subsides, I am sure that the local citizens will continue to use our local gyms, of which forested recreation areas and greenways are included, especially Umstead State Park and the old Reedy Creek Road Greenway Recreation Corridor. This corridor is not only a benefit to citizens, it is a unique vacation spot in the midst of our urban area. A vacation spot is a tourist attraction. Don't we want to attract visitors to our wonderful city? There are efforts now for a bikeway along the I-40 corridor connecting Raleigh to Durham and Chapel Hill. Just imagine the three anchors of the RTP being connected by a greenway that goes through a great state park. Just imagine the tourism dollars that will bring in. I spent last weekend in Central Florida. Why? 
I visited Florida's Cross State Greenway, a 110-acre mile linear park that hosts more than 300 miles of trails of all types, paddling, hiking, mountain biking, equestrian, and paved multi-use. Connected to or nearby this greenway are campgrounds and hotels. I paid for two hotel nights and a few dollars, a few days of food and beer, tourism dollars. Just imagine um, something like this as a recruiting feature for many of the large industries in this area. The preservation of odd fellows and contributes to the success. A rock quarry stops the success. I know you all want a strong and vibrant city. To be such, in addition to developed spaces, you must also treasure and protect our natural resources, especially those one in a million resources like a well-connected, easily accessible, large forested recreation space in the middle of our urban area. This morning, I was listening to some older music and some lyrics stuck, stuck with me. You've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. You've got to be your own man, not a puppet on a string. Never compromise what's right. Also, it means nothing if you don't stand for something. As the towns of Morrisville and Cary have done, please make a stronger statement. Ask NCDEQ to deny the quarry pit on Oddfellows. Ask DEQ to reinstate the sunset clause on the Triangle Quarry. I emailed you guys the link to the Florida um, Thank you, Natalie. Next, we have Bob Geary. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, Bob Geary, 202 East Park Drive, like Kwa Huang and Wanda Gilbert Coker. I'm a member of the Wake County Housing Justice Coalition. Uh, like Stephanie Lorman, I remember Biscuit Gate all too well. And uh, Natalie Liu is right about the quarry. It'd be nice if you all listened. Uh, the Housing Justice Coalition believes that safe, affordable housing is a fundamental right and should encompass the renovation of already existing low-income housing by protecting our historically black and brown neighborhoods from gentrification. I want to address the $80 million affordable housing bond issue. The coalition does not support the bond. We wish we could, but as it stands, we cannot. The reason is that nothing in your bond plan assures that the $80 million will benefit low-income people. Now, you would think an affordable housing bond, by definition, would help low-income people, but in Raleigh, you'd be wrong. I say that because, based on the data supplied to you by your Housing and Neighborhoods Department, almost all of the affordable housing money spent by the city the last five years has helped moderate-income people, not low-income. The city, in other words, subsidizes developers who build for the moderate income strata. Low income families have been largely excluded. We urge this council, as we've been doing now for six months, to commit to a new policy that puts low income families first in line for the bond money. You can continue to use other housing funds, as you've been doing, to back developers who build for the moderate income strata. But the biggest need in Raleigh by far is the severe shortage of affordable housing for the tens of thousands of, income, of low income families who work at minimum wage or near minimum wage jobs. And this need, of course, is getting worse every day. The $80 million, if passed, will be new money. It should serve a new purpose. Use it to help the people in the greatest need. Members of council, your time to get this right uh, is growing short. Early voting starts soon. At your July 7th meeting, we were assured that housing and neighborhood staff would be, quote, back in a month, unquote, with the necessary policy commitments for your consideration. That was July 7th. It's been more than a month. But once again, this topic is not listed on today's agenda. I wonder why. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Geary. Um, this topic is on the agenda for um, September at one of our work sessions. I believe it's the second um, city manager. September 1st, Mayor. Okay, September 1st. Thank you. Um, next, we have Zaina Baloche. Yes, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. My name is Zainab and I live in Southeast Raleigh. Um, I'm making a comment today regarding the proposal Deck Brown will make later today on adding a mental health unit under RPD. We expect our proposal to be rejected by the council unit unanimously. Here's why. 
First, I want to remind y'all that Raleigh Demands Justice has had multiple conversations with you, Marianne, as well as others on putting more resources to mental health and making it clear that it should be separated from the police. We discussed this very idea and made it clear that people are against putting this under RPD. <clears throat> Yet that is the exact thing being proposed under the negligent leadership of Deck Brown. It has been estimated that people suffering mental health issues are 16 times more likely to be killed by police officers due to first responders being unaware of their condition. The police should not respond to any mental health situations. They are not trained for that. When you respond to a mental health situation with a gun, you automatically escalate it. The highest education a police officer needs is a high school degree. Do we want 18 year olds responding to an individual having a manic attack? Mental health specialists go to university for at least four years and get into debt to be able to serve the community. If police aren't needed, let's leave them out completely. I want to remind you about the number of the murders of Keith Collins and Sohail Muharib by RPD, both with severe mental illnesses. Earlier this year, RPD murdered Keith Collins within three minutes of getting the dispatch call. Officer W.B. Tapscott is still on RPD after he shot Keith four times and then another seven rounds while he was on the ground. Their blood is on your hands. And while you refuse to accept accountability from the people, a reminder that there is still a God you will answer to. Mental health responses can be handled without police if funded and structured well with properly trained and adequately paid professionals. This isn't just an issue in Raleigh, it's national which means there are already better examples of what has worked in other cities. What hasn't worked is letting the police manage a mental health unit. We are taking basic steps on issues that we are decades behind on. I want to remind y'all that all of you campaigned on improving policing in Raleigh and have yet to make any impactful change. Since the council seems to lack any innovation, probably due to the lack of age and racial diversity, Here's a better example. In Oregon, instead of sending police officers to a mental health crisis, dispatchers send a crisis worker and a medic. Last year, the team received 24,000 calls. They asked for police backup in 150 cases, less than 1% of calls. Also get this, it saved hospitals $4 million each year. Many people in crisis do not need a police officer, but someone to listen or help them connect to services. The people of Raleigh suffering from mental health issues shouldn't have to suffer more. We must commit to our crisis need a commitment that they won't get arrested or be met with an officer with a weapon or else they'll be you know, no. <sighs> Next we have Todd Mormon. Todd was unable to attend today. Okay, next we have Sean um, Polenz. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can, Sean. We've lost you. Sean, can you try again? I think you had muted yourself. I'm sorry, can you guys hear me now? We can now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'll try and be brief. Um, I was just calling to follow up um, on what a few other folks have said about um, city council members blocking people online. Um, you know, I think you guys already got a, a little bit of a, a briefing on some of the case law. Um, so I just wanted to say this has been an ongoing issue for at least a couple of years. Um, of course, the law has only been definitively declared one way or the other for a couple of years. So I'm trying my best as an attorney to give the city uh, as long of a grace period as possible before we all get our feet under us uh, in terms of what is and is not allowed on social media. So, um, but I want to be clear. Um, I think that there's a legal issue um, that has been exposed and it can cost the city a great deal of money to defend. Um, I'm happy to continue working with the city and city council members to avoid needless litigation, particularly uh, during a pandemic when resources are already scarce. Um, you know, I hope that the city attorney will take the lead on this. And I, I just want to say, I, I literally spoke, I think it was five of the five or six of you I spoke with during the campaign, along with many of your opponents um, who, who, who didn't win. And 
you know, this was about the decorum rule in particular, and you all seemed very amenable to making positive First Amendment related changes. Um, but, you know, while I'm not looking, y'all are out here blocking folks who disagree with you, silencing their free speech. Um, it can't really be tolerated in a free community like Raleigh. So I'm here to let you guys know that I'm watching and that steps are going to be taken in the future. But hopefully um, you're all willing to work with us concerned citizens and make sure that our voices are heard in a free and open fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And um, last, we have Michael Lindsay. Six Park Drive. Uh, hi, Marianne, or how, I should say, hi, Mayor Baldwin and City Council members. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. I want to call your attention to a problem that our citizen advisory councils are having since your February 4th vote to abolish the city's support of Raleigh CACs. As you may know, uh, many CACs are continuing to meet right now through Zoom meetings. We are doing all the same things we used to do before losing our city support and the coronavirus epidemic set in. Unfortunately, we are now having developers tell us they can't join us for our Zoom meetings because of the language in one of the resolutions passed on February 4th. That language reads, and I quote, but in no event may any rezoning case appear on a CAC agenda later than 45 days from today. Wow, talk about free speech. I doubt the city has the legal authority to tell one group or person not to talk with an other group or person. We all know the surprise February 4th resolutions were developed in secret, which kept the public and at least one counselor in the dark. Is it possible that that secret process created an illegal resolution? If so, isn't this why openness and transparency are so important for good government? This wording may be the result of incompetence that was not checked by an open process, or it may have been deliberate. Perhaps the six who voted for the resolution were not satisfied with just cutting off support for CACs, but they also wanted to reduce citizens' opportunities to talk with developers about rezoning requests. Whatever your intentions were then, now is the time to do the right thing. Please pass a new resolution that corrects your mistake. It might be good to check with the city's legal staff to make sure it's done right this time. Uh, perhaps issuing a press release about the new resolution would help clear things up for the public and undo some of the damage that's been done since February 4th. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna ask the city attorney to address this, if you would. Yes, Mayor, I'm glad to do so. If you look back at, just as a preliminary matter, the city council only has control over city boards and commissions that are affiliated with and are sponsored by the city. I will say that the CACs or the groups that are now calling themselves the CACs are no longer affiliated with or sponsored by the city. So taking that as an initial um, premise, so the city council does not and has not told private neighborhood groups who they can and cannot meet with. If you look at the total motion that was passed in February, the first part of the motion basically says that the activities and city funding and staff support of the CACs would be um, ceasing effective immediately. So what that motion did is it disassociated the city um, from the, the CACs. So at that point, um, they were no longer city boards. But if you read the motion a little further, it basically said that it had, they had 45 more days, if you will, to sort of unwind and finish their business. So that 45 day period was, as the motion says, an opportunity for the CACs to finish whatever they had on their agenda, if you will. And at the end of that 45 days, the city's relationship with those groups was ended. So I do not believe as a legal matter that that motion did anything to control anything that these groups, which are now um, 
calling themselves the CACs, and they have the right to call themselves that, but they are not the same entities that existed when they were related to the city. So it is fine for developers to meet with those groups if they so desire, but they're not required to do that because the CACs are not any longer a part of the city's rezoning process. So they are, would be like any other um, homeowners association, neighborhood group, group of individuals that uh, a zoning applicant could choose to meet with, but is not required to meet with, and the city doesn't have any control at all over who appears and who doesn't. And I do not believe that was the intent of the motion, but if council wants to clarify it further, they can. But I think at the end of that 45 days, that again, the city's relationship with the CACs as they previously existed ended, and now those groups um, are not city affiliated and are on their own, if you will. And so whatever the developer and the groups agree to do, they're free to do without city council involvement. And I hope I answered your question. If not, I'm glad to follow up. Councillor Cox. Yeah, I just want to point out that historically uh, it's been repeated in public many, many times that the CACs were independent organizations. And uh, they're as independent as, as, uh, as the Chamber of Commerce, who also receives funding from the, uh, from the City Council. So to say that their status has changed, I don't think it's quite right. I mean, we could, we could stop funding the, the Chamber of Commerce tomorrow, but it doesn't stop being the Chamber of Commerce. Its entity status does not change. And it's been well documented that the CACs were set up and run independently. They had independent elections for their officers. And uh, and I think that needs to, to bear on this matter. I'll just follow up real quickly. The CACs were created by a motion of the council in 1974. And they also had council staff and were a part of the rezoning process. And so, um, however you want to categorize them independent or not, I think the real question is whether or not the council was going to um, include the CAC recommendations or votes as a part of their rezoning process. And so at the end of 45 days, that was not happening anymore. And the city was saying, you know, we're not going to provide you staff or money. So right now, I'm all I'm saying is I do not think that the city council is or has told those groups who they can meet with or who they can't meet with. Um, as far as whatever whatever else goes on, that's fine. But the clarification, as I understand it, is are developers being told by the city council not to appear in front of these groups? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, and that the city council couldn't do that, nor have they done that. And that that is a voluntary relationship between the, the CACs and the, the developers. And if someone wants to try to present whatever the result of the meeting is to the city council, they can do that and the city council can accept it or not. It is not a part of the process any longer, I guess is the shorter answer. Well, I think that uh, passing a new resolution, making that perfectly crystal clear would be the appropriate course of action. Otherwise, we have a we have a resolution out there that is ambiguous, and uh, and leads people to believe that they are being instructed by this city council not to meet with the CACs. Okay, um, Councillor um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm I think it's clear to me that any developer um bit large or small can meet with any group that they see fit for their particular project um that's something i've always stated and fought for and i'm actually was one of the ones that fought at least for that 45 days to go past when that motion was made um to allow closure on some projects that i know were before cac's so i mean i think it's clear um you know, I don't know what resolution or anything else is needed, but I think, you know, if as long as all we all here clearly stated that developers have a choice to meet with whom they choose to meet to want to meet with um, in the community. 
Um, our policies require the neighborhood meetings, the first one and the second one. That's those are the requirements that we have. But any additional meetings that a developer would like to have with individuals in the community, um, that's up to that developer. And if they, you know, and it goes from there. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I think the city attorney has made it clear that developers are not prohibited for a meeting with the groups that now call themselves CACs and that they are free to choose whether to um, attend meetings with any neighborhood group. So, um, okay, thank you. And I believe two people brought that up in public comment. So I hope this um, answers their question. Okay, now we're on to the report and recommendation of the Planning Commission. Mayor. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to indicate we did receive uh, several uh, public comments, um, written comments, and they have been passed along to the City Council for your information. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have um, the, who was, who let's see, the commit. Planning Commission report is first, followed by um, rezoning Z1719. Ken Bowers. Yes, great, thanks. Just waiting for the slides to come on. Um, we have uh, we have six items to report out for you today. We'll start as we typically do by showing you what is currently um, scheduled for the September 1st public hearing, we have one ETJ issue, one text change, and three zoning cases currently on the agenda for the evening public hearing. Okay. So four items have been reported out um, from the last Planning Commission meeting, which was held a week ago, uh, all recommended to be added to that September 1st, 2020 public hearing, uh, Z1719 on Capitol Boulevard, Z1519, which is on Method Road, uh, just north of Western Boulevard, Z820, 510 Carolina Avenue, and a text change for zoning conditions for the Crabtree Village um, zoning, which is uh, also known as Kids Hill. And with that, um, these could be scheduled for that public hearing, I believe, by a single motion if there's no desire to pick a different date. Um, I can't see all of you. Madam Mayor, this is Councilman Branch. Yes. Um, I move for approval for the public hearing of September at our first September meeting um, for these four items. Do I have a second? Okay, Councilor Melton has seconded that. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously, Clerk. Next. Slides back. Um, so we had two items that I'll review in just a second where the Planning Commission has requested some additional time. And I'll give a little bit of background on that. So. So the first one is Z3119 uh, Needham Road in District C. This is this is out um, south of Buffalo Road um, <clears throat> near the 540 Outer Loop. The, this has been a controversial case. There are a number of issues attached to it. The Planning Commission um, would like to get some additional information, which they've requested from both the applicant and from staff. Uh, primary concerns are uh, the ability of transportation infrastructure to serve the requested density of development out here. And so they've asked for a 60-day extension for that item. The other one is the 420 1701 Trailwood Drive. Um, this was heard, at, uh, heard by the commission at their last meeting. Um, there had been very little communication with the applicant and the neighbors. Uh, there were a number of neighbors signed up to speak uh, who had concerns with it at the meeting. The applicant is uh, planning to do some outreach with the neighbors and modify the case um, by either converting it from general to conditional use or, and, or potentially changing the district that's being requested. So uh, some more time needs uh, to be granted for that to happen. Okay. Um, Ken, could you take down the presentation? 
Yes. Thank you. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to approve a thirty um, a sixty day extension for both of these um, cases? Move for approval. Do I have a second? Councillor Melton. Okay. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you, Ken. Um, next, we have special items, and we will have a report from, um, let's see, Jim Green from the City Manager's Office on Downtown Public Safety and Economic Recovery. Mayor, members of council, good afternoon. I'm Jim Green, Assistant City Manager. With me today is Bill King, uh, CEO and President of Downtown Raleigh Association. Uh, your last meeting in July, July 7th, Bill and I uh, tag team to give you an overview of the status of downtown. At that uh, meeting, I also recommended some additional funding for the DRA, which council approved since that meeting. Um, we've had some questions from council members and others about the status of the downtown, so thought it'd be good if uh, Bill and I came back today to provide you an update. Um, obviously, downtown, very important to the city, the heart of the city, and uh, we all uh, very much want a active, growing, and successful downtown, but just like other businesses uh, or other areas of the city, uh, the businesses and the downtown in particular have been impacted by the COVID pandemic, uh, relying a lot on the office workers, the businesses in the downtown are, are suffering while those office workers continue to telework. Additionally, uh, tourism is important for the businesses downtown. And uh, with not being able to have conferences or events, art shows, concerts, it's impacting those businesses. Uh, also, the social unrest, the um, uh, impacts from the property damage in uh, the last weekend in May, um, uh, still uh, impacting downtown businesses. And we're seeing uh, some repair and replacement, a lot of work that's being done by city departments to assist DRA in downtown, and really wanted to share some of that information um, that uh, the city departments have been providing over the uh, past few months. If we could hit the slides, please. Thank you. Mayor and Council, you have a uh, complete memo in your agenda item, but just pulled out some of the information uh, that uh, city departments, the services uh, that they've been providing the downtown since the end of May. Um, you'll remember there was significant damage to the downtown. The Sunday and Monday after uh, the unrest, we had approximately 125 uh, city workers in the downtown helping to clean up uh, both day, Sunday and Monday, and uh, worked pretty much all day. We had a lot of city equipment as well, from street sweepers to, you can see, 14 solid waste trucks that collected and hauled away about 30 tons of glass and debris. Uh, the city uh, Department of Engineering Services has repaired and replaced the 25 broken windows and doors that we saw at city buildings, and uh, just about all of the concrete planters in the downtown were damaged. Parks and Rec is in the process of ordering those and hopes to have those planters replaced in October. Also, our Go Raleigh station received dam uh, damage. The information booth, that's been repaired, and uh, also several signs and shelters and continue to work to replace those um, signs. Um, 
A lot has been coordinated with DRA, and one of the things that we did was our solid waste department right after the uh, property damage, work with DRA to strategically locate some dumpsters around the downtown so the businesses could use those dumpsters to dispose of whatever they needed at no cost. Uh, also, transportation has worked hard to reestablish the curbside pickup zones for restaurants. There were about 100 of those that were damaged. Cones were uh, taken, so those have been reestablished. Uh, uh, our planning department were, has worked carefully and closely with the downtown, assigning an individual from the inspections uh, staff and developing an efficient permitting process for those businesses and property owners with, wishing to move forward with repair and replacement. Um, you see that uh, transportation has also worked with the expedited review and approval about 30 outdoor uh, locations for outdoor dining. Also, we're trying to activate and get folks downtown, so the transit fares and the uh, $5 after five parking requirement has also been suspended. Uh, Raleigh Police has spent a tremendous amount of time in the downtown working with the businesses, meeting with all the businesses that were impacted uh, shortly after the um, uh, unrest. Uh, also uh, have participated in many virtual meetings with neighborhood groups, uh, but also with business owners and residents of the downtown. Police Department has also been coordinating outreach to the homeless, uh, recently worked on a project with First Baptist Church to feed and clothe the homeless. Uh, the uh, hotels on Fayetteville Street also received damage. Police Department has conducted an outreach for the hotels and assigned a liaison to work with those hotels. Communication is key, and uh, the Police Department communicates weekly, sometimes daily, with the DRA to share information and education for the businesses, uh, continuing the COVID education with with the Emergency Management Department. Some other things, Raleigh Arts has been very busy working closely with DRA um, on uh, sidewalk paintings, about 30, um, excuse me, uh, yes, about 30 um, uh, new sidewalk paintings should go in this fall. Raleigh Arts also is working to document all the public art that was created as part of the protest and working with DRA on that. Economic Development holds weekly virtual meetings with DRA and other alliances to communicate on funding opportunities like the county uh, small business loan, but also looking for opportunities to promote and market uh, downtown businesses and other businesses throughout the city. You're gonna see uh, what we're calling a, a hyper-local marketing campaign that uh, economic development is working on with the Convention Investors Bureau to shop, to uh, encourage shopping local. Uh, also, um, uh, Office of Economic Development will be uh, rolling out some additional grant programs, our traditional building up that grant and partners grant uh, during this fall. Uh, working closely with the hotels, obviously they've been impacted, so Carrie Painter, our Convention Center Director, uh, communicates and meets regularly with the CVB and those hotels to discuss opportunities and reopening. And finally, as I mentioned, as approved last month, City Council uh, did approve 300000 uh, from the economic development budget to go to DRA for the uh, improved ambassador, increased ambassadors, and um, uh, strategic marketing. Bill King is here today to provide some updates and, um, on those two programs. So as we move forward, three items just to really point out. We want to continue to partner with the DRA to reactivate the downtown. We've got to get people downtown, and it's tough right now with COVID. So working with DRA to promote and activate the downtown, the city's doing that in several ways. I mentioned the arts programs 
and trying to activate through arts. Make sure those transportation options are available um, where uh, Folks can visit downtown uh, with transit or come at night, and there's no co cost to, to parking. Also, activation through uh, outdoor dining and other opportunities. We want that activation, though, to, to be safe and focus on public health and social services. So working with restaurants and others to be a resource. Uh, I mentioned what we're doing between the, the police department and our emergency management team to educate bars and restaurants. Uh, we're investing in the ambassador program and the police department are, are working carefully with uh, DRA and downtown businesses. And then with social services, working with our partners uh, at the county, but other partners as well to help those folks in need. And finally, to make sure we're uh, working with the downtown and, and helping to address concerns, learn collaborate, pivot, and innovate. So what can we learn from others? What are those best practices that other downtowns, other communities are doing? How can we collaborate, whether it's DRA, businesses, uh, residents being open to those ideas? Pivot, what the city may have done a year ago or five years ago, uh, what businesses may have done. Uh, how can we pivot to make sure that uh, we're working well and working together uh, under the new normal? And finally, innovate. Let's try new things. They all won't work out, but uh, we have to be open to uh, innovation and trying new things. So a lot of work from city department has uh, gone into the downtown, but there's still much more to do. With that, let me turn it over to Bill King, King to share some of the things that DRA is doing. Okay, thank you so much, Mayor and Council. I'm Bill King with the Downtown Raleigh Alliance. And if I could have uh, slides. Yep, those are the ones. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of what's going on in downtown and then some of our work uh, in partnership with the city and our businesses and residents. So let me give you just a, a few stats on the current status in downtown Raleigh. Uh, obviously, we are uh, at a significantly reduced amount of activity uh, compared to usual. Uh, so right now, we estimate a uh, number of employees in our downtown offices. We're at about 15 to 20 percent uh, of occupancy of those currently. Uh, we've talked to building managers and also looked at some of the parking deck data. Uh, so obviously, that's a significant reduction in the number of office employees we usually have. Our hotel occupancy is still low and fluctuating between weekday and weekend. We have a little bit more occupancy on the weekend, but still quite low from where we were earlier this year. Uh, we have pedestrian counters located across downtown, and those are showing a 74% reduction in traffic. Um, we do have 55 storefronts uh, with boards still up, but that's actually only about 33% of those affected. We know uh, we still need to get more down, but um, that's uh, we've gotten a good many down already. And then food and beverage sales are, are down 56% from a year ago. Uh, but that's improved 46% from the previous month. It's actually triple the sales we had in April, which were only 16% of the previous year. I know it's a bit confusing, so I'll walk you through that in just a second. Um, so these are our food and beverage sales for downtown. The blue bars are in 2019. The orange bars are 2020. So you can see uh, in February, we started to see a little bit of a reduction. In March, we saw a significant one. Obviously, we're in the midst of stay-at-home orders through April. In May, they went up slightly as those began to lift towards the end of that month and then they went up in June. So you're seeing a gradual increase in food and beverage sales in downtown. But those food and beverage sales are not necessarily distributed the same way they used to be. So uh, this is a chart from a year ago uh, by district of where sales were. So you can see in particular, Glenwood South and Fayetteville Street uh, were pretty even. Both were close to about a third of sales a year ago. You can see now those have shifted. So Glenwood South uh, is uh, carrying over half of our sales and what you're seeing is really the effect of reduced office occupancy, reduced hotels and visitors uh, in the Fayetteville Street core along with Moore Square. So um, there's been some focus there and you'll see some of this work um, is sort of bifurcated depending on the needs of each district. Uh, but there are some uh, good metrics in downtown. So we still have over 100 restaurants open in some capacity. A lot of them are takeout uh, or outdoor only. Some are doing indoor service. Uh, we are still the largest collection of locally owned businesses in the region. So our retailers are 93% locally owned. So 
Um, we have a lot of those great businesses you think of when you think of Raleigh. We're slowly seeing uh, sales increase, which is a good thing. Uh, development and land sales are continuing in downtown. Our residential occupancy is actually quite high. So for those buildings that are not in lease-up phase, that are not brand new, we're still seeing occupancy over 90%. Um, in a recent uh, survey we did, we had over 1,100 respondents. 80% still feel safe in downtown. That is a little bit of a reduction from last year. Um, so we want to make sure with these new resources that we get that back up. But we still feel like there is a safe downtown here. We want to make sure people continue to feel that way. And then, of course, we have a new grocery store opening in September. So some of the questions we're trying to answer in our current situation and with the work I'm about to walk you through is about how do we help our businesses survive? Um, how do we make sure that we still have a reputation as a safe place? Uh, we want to be more diverse and welcoming. We need to make sure that we keep that in mind during this moment. Uh, how do we make living downtown attractive? Uh, how do we prepare for changes in positioning downtown for the future? Uh, how do we encourage the rest of Raleigh to support downtown's revival? And what do we learn for this uh, for the future? So these are sort of the buckets, and I'm going to walk you through each of these uh, so you don't have to absorb this immediately. But you can see we have a lot of different lines of work we're working on in this moment to make sure that downtown is able to recover and be stronger than before. So public health, the reality is that the best thing for all of us is to get this virus under control. And so everything we do is done through a lens of public health. We wanna make sure that first and foremost, people are safe down here. So um, we're uh, making sure that our communications have a public health orientation. Uh, we'll be putting banners on Fayetteville Street soon uh, that will encourage wearing masks uh, and make sure that people uh, follow those rules. Uh, each weekend, in partnership with the City of Raleigh, we have deployed ambassadors uh, along Glenwood South to encourage social distance and mask wearing. Uh, we have a website that has uh, all of the restaurants in downtown that offer outdoor dining. So for consumers who are more comfortable with outdoor dining, uh, that is on our website. And we have a goal of making sure that downtown is the safest place to dine and spend time in Raleigh. Um, so from that survey, we had a lot of um, ideas from the public on what they'd like to see in downtown businesses to make themselves feel safe. So we've shared this information with our downtown businesses so that they can follow these um, along with their staff. Equity and diversity. So this is something that we really need to be responsive to. We need to make sure that downtown is a place where more people feel welcome, that we reflect the diversity of our community, and we take this opportunity to do that. So we want to continue our work on activating pop-up spaces for uh, minority-owned businesses. That continues work we started last year with Wake Tech. We uh, developed a website for all black-owned businesses in downtown to encourage consumers to support those businesses. We've also done buddy videos with diverse entrepreneurs. Uh, we have continued and uh, increased our recruitment of diverse businesses. And really, we, we need to make downtown more diverse and welcoming. Plywood board removal is something uh, that is a more near-term need. Uh, like I mentioned, 55 storefronts with boards still up as of last week, but that means more than 66% of boards are now removed from businesses that were affected. And we did have some boards go up on businesses that were not damaged, so actually that percentage is even higher when you factor them in. So we've had good progress there. We know that uh, there's still some more work to be done. We've contacted most of those property owners and businesses to gauge any needs for helping bring them down. Uh, most of the reasoning is uh, glass back order, so obviously glass is in a lot of demand. And so that's the number one reason we get for uh, boards still being up, some others with insurance, other repairs needed, and tenants determining their strategy for reopening. We also are aiding and documenting and preserving art on the boards. So we have helped with that. We're um, very supportive of that. There's some tremendous art created during this. We want to make sure that that art uh, is still seen by the public and understood. It was very powerful. And so we want to make sure we get these down quickly and help preserve and celebrate the art on those boards. Safety and security. Uh, we have four additional ambassadors starting this month. Three for safety that are focused specifically on hot spots of activity, so that's areas where there's increased uh, activity or concerns, and also interacting with our residential communities to ensure them of their safety. We did hire one ambassador that was previously uh, approved for social services, so that's a service worker, or excuse me, a social worker, and will help focusing on those in need, so developing relationship with those in need on our streets to help them identify resources uh, and to help them be okay uh, and safe. Uh, we have been working with the Capital Area Workforce Development Board on training and candidates for these, so we've been excited about that partnership. Thank you to the city for connecting us there. Uh, we brought on an additional ambassador manager uh, with extensive security experience who's done a great job. And part of what they've done is help align uh, our routes uh, and our focus uh, with crime and incident data. Uh, storefront uh, business support. Uh, we are working on a repair and pivot grant program, uh, which we're excited about. So that will help provide some funds to businesses so that they can be able to pivot in this moment 
so think about things like expanded outdoor dining furniture, uh, things along those lines. Um, we're giving marketing support for reopenings when businesses do reopen. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the city of Raleigh on expanded outdoor dining, so thank you for that as well. And curbside parking zones, the city's been very responsive on those and they've been a lifeline uh, for a lot of our downtown businesses. We've updated our website with all the open businesses. We update that every week, so we try to keep that fresh. And we've added some additional signage in those areas where it might be hard to see where businesses are open. Uh, marketing, obviously this is part of the city's support, so we have hired a firm to begin that work. Uh, public health will dictate that pace, so in the near term, we're really focused on supporting safely. Long term, we're looking at more of that place branding, strategic branding for downtown, when it's safer to get more and more people back into downtown. We have done a series of We Are DTR videos where we featured our local entrepreneurs in downtown. This has been very popular. Uh, we've done about 20 of those. Uh, we're doing weekly contests that have been getting a lot of good traction. Uh, so we'd give away gift cards uh, to our local businesses. And we have significant resources invested, including $150,000 of city funds in our strategic marketing. So some of what we'll be looking for is a strategic marketing plan, uh, promotions that are aligned with public health regulations while increasing business, advertising campaigns to support downtown's recovery. Some of the ways we measure that would be through increased sales, increased foot traffic, surveying on perceptions and frequency of visits to downtown, openings and closing in storefront businesses, and interest in new businesses locating downtown. And then, of course, some of the activity metrics, some of the activities that you do that with are those promotions, advertising purchases, impressions on people reached by ads and social media, and engagement with social media. So we're looking to get people to think of how they can support downtown Raleigh. So we'd love it if people even chose to exercise downtown. And we're trying to do some pre-built routes so that people can do so. Just having people you know, feed on the street in a safe way is really helpful to downtown. Uh, there are some groups who've done some socially distanced lunches and meetings outside to create more presence on the street. Uh, that's great if, if groups are comfortable with that. We would encourage you to follow all public health regulations if you do that. Uh, we are encouraging volunteering to support our services and our shelters that support downtown who are in need right now. Um, and we want deliberate and safe support of our businesses. Uh, another thing we're trying to do is pop-up activation of public art. Obviously, we're challenged with we would love to have more activity downtown, but we need to do it safely. So we're looking at what are some attention-grabbing art installations to generate attention. We've had some great conversations on that. We're looking at taking some of our vacant storefronts and activating them um, through temporary art or temporary tenants. So I mentioned earlier our work on diversity there, but there's also some opportunities for some public art here. Um, we've already done quite a few virtual events and self-guided tours. The image here is a map of uh, all the murals in downtown Raleigh. So we developed an online self-guided tour. You can see all the murals downtown. That's been very popular. Uh, we did a scavenger hunt a couple weeks ago that was well attended, but was safe. Uh, and so we're trying to make sure that we offer opportunities to come downtown that are thoughtful and safe. Finally, as part of that, making sure that residential communities feel important, um, we've been programming with music and entertainment for our downtown residential buildings. So we have five buildings uh, that'll be getting some music there. It'll be sort of in their courtyard. It'll be safe uh, for the residents. Again, socially distanced, but another way to make living downtown fun. And then finally, of course, We'll continue to collect information and data, like some of the data we've shared with you today, to make sure that we're measuring the impact uh, of both these, uh, the crisis, but also uh, the steps we're taking to address it and share that with you. We will have a virtual State of Downtown event in September that will share some of this information, as well as starting to generate more confidence in our downtown market, which was very robust beforehand, and we feel confident and will be robust again. And we finally want to think about what, we, what should we be taking away from this time for the future? So this is a running list, but what should we take away that we can uh, help downtown so that if we're in another crisis like this in the future, we're prepared? And so whether that's public health concerns for public spaces, safety and security changes, improved diversity and equitable opportunities, uh, parking and curbside adjustments, uh, police engagement with businesses, residents, and property owners, plans for those in need in similar crises, communication for crises and events, how do we bring back special events in a way that benefits downtown, and changes in infrastructure. So as you can see, the themes are really about supporting safely, emphasizing public health. Uh, we need everyone to help downtown to help this whole community. Using this moment to improve downtown on equity and diversity, getting more feet on the street in a safe way, learning, pivoting, and being more resilient for the future. So I want to thank you again for your support. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Bill and Jim. Um, do we have any questions from Council? Um, Councillor Knight? 
Thank you. Um, I appreciate it, Jim and Bill. This is uh, very timely and uh, and helpful. Um, as you know, we as counselors are getting questions every day about what's happening downtown uh, and what's going on. And, and those of us that don't represent downtown uh, may be a little bit uh, distant from it, but we are trying our best to do all we can to help the downtown uh, uh, residents and business owners come back. And so we want to be part of that and, and stay involved. So this is helpful. A um, couple of specific questions. One, the larger businesses down there, you know, Red Hat, Citrix, the law firms, how uh, detailed or granular are y'all getting in seeing how when they're coming back to uh, bringing their employees back into the offices um, based on uh, the, you know, the state phases. Uh, is, are y'all having those, conver uh, those conversations just so we could, you know, as a city planning out uh, and other businesses that, uh, that relate to them, uh, restaurants, et cetera, um, can sort of plan, I guess, um, if you will. Uh, yes, we are having those conversations, so we do keep up with as many employers as we can on their plans for returning. A lot of them are in the same state right now, which is um, currently obviously not safe uh, to bring everybody back at full force. And so some have done so at reduced capacity. Some are still mostly at work from home. Um, so we do keep in touch with them on a regular basis, so we know those plans. As you know, you know the, the virus itself right now, um, the numbers increased recently. And so we're still at a state where um, we haven't moved as a state into phase three. And I think, you know, while we're at this state, a lot of our office employers are still in the same plans they were in, um, but they do keep in regular touch with us so that then we can prepare our businesses for when those folks come back. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. And then one last, the next question, the status of residential, the residential space down there, um, how is that going in terms of apartments, condominiums, uh, ownership and, and rental? Uh, capacity uh, in terms of uh, residential so our apartments are at this point still over 90 percent occupied uh, which is good and so again we have two buildings that are in what you call lease up phase so they're new and uh, they're still leasing up but um, you know the others are all still very high occupancy so that's a good thing um, and then we still are seeing condo sales as well so our residential base has um, largely held which is great Okay. Thanks so much. Keep up the good work um, and, and let us let us help in any way we can. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Melton. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I was just trying to look through the presentation because I thought I saw a line um, about the commercial real estate and development. I'm not sure if you touched on that, but have you been in touch with any of the uh, developers or attorneys for projects that were announced downtown that have not broken ground yet? And do we have an understanding of, you know, are those moving forward uh, and what effect that's going to have on sort of the economic rebound with the downtown businesses? Uh, we are certainly in touch with a lot of those folks. I'd say the status kind of varies um, from project to project. There has been a bit of a slowdown, uh, understandably, um, but uh, we have had no projects canceled. Um, so I think we've had some slow down their progress a little bit, but we still have a lot who feel really good about the market. They feel good about Raleigh. And so they fully plan on building and I think are just sort of aligning um, things like financing and timing uh, with where they see the market going. So it's slowed down a little bit, but um, we've actually seen good activity there. And again, all of our projects are still on. Um, it's just timelines have varied a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, Bill, two things that, um, I had brought up one was the alert system that our downtown business owners had um, requested. And then the second is um, we, and this I guess is more for Jim, but um, I had asked y'all to look at the, um, the um, facade grants and whether that funding would be needed and when it might be needed. So just an update on that. Sure, Mayor, thank you. Uh, first on the alert or communication system for the downtown, that is something staff is evaluating now. Uh, there's some issues with that and uh, how we would um, 
get the information, the names and, and contact information as part of that system, uh, but we're reviewing that now and evaluating a, a pilot program that we could work with DRA to gather that information. So that is still under review. Uh, staff did uh, also review the facade grant. We have about $100,000 in that account with the uh, program and the grant that Bill just mentioned, the uh, pivot and replacement grant. Uh, staff would recommend that rather than use any money from the facade grant right now, for us to hold that and continue to evaluate options to use that in the future and evaluate what new needs or new issues may come up. So we're working closely with our planning department who's over the facade grant to uh, continue to evaluate future use. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Branch? Yeah, I have one question for um, Bill. Um, when do you um, plan, when do you believe your social worker will be online and start working um, with the um, citizens downtown? Yeah, so we have um, made a hire, and so we're in that process of um, finalizing that, I would expect, by the beginning of September. Okay. Any other Thank you. questions? Okay, thank you so much. Great presentation and update. Um, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jim. Next, we have um, the Police Homelessness and Mental Health Unit um, with Chief um, Deck Brown leading that discussion. Mayor and Council, uh, Mayor, if I could, while they're transitioning for the chief and the presentation, I just want to make a couple of introductory comments if I could, um, yes, yes. Uh, as she kind of gets herself prepared. Uh, just a couple of things worth mentioning. First of all, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that this is a national issue association associated with the nature of policing in the future, as well as the relationship with issues of homelessness and mental health. It is something that cities across the country are currently grappling with at all levels. You see that in publications, you see it, at, you've seen it previously at conferences, there's various task forces. And there are, as, as many of you know, there's certain example programs, but then there's also quite a lot of discussion about how that social relationship and policing will fit together. And so I don't believe at this point there is a consensus on any right answer. Um, you. You may recall that the issues of homelessness and mental health came up at the suggestion of the Raleigh Police Department back in February when we talked about at the retreat as well as putting together their budget proposal uh, and, and including a component associated with that actually before we had some of the events occur. So this is something that's been on all our minds for quite a while. Um, during the budget deliberations, this discussion came up and was of interest to the council, and the chief had made a statement that she was going to look at some program ideas and bring that back for, for to propose to you, and that uh, today we are happy to announce what the next steps the police department is going to take. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you to the chief for her leadership on this topic and for being uh, proactive in this space and um, look forward to her presentation today. The last thing is just an observation uh, to, to sort of put this in context before the chief begins. Um, when we talk across the country with a lot of other cities and a lot of other managers, regardless of what, where units or staffing or resources goes associated with homelessness and mental health, and you look across the country there in all kinds of different places, it doesn't change the issue in the Raleigh Police Department that issues of uh, homelessness and mental health are something that they are going to continue to face. Police officers today, and I'm not a police chief, so I'm not speaking with direct personal experience, but just as uh, someone in the, in the public administration business, that police officers today, perhaps even more than ever, are being asked to deal with sets of challenges that, out, that go outside the traditional framework of policing. And so, whether or not you put the topics within the department or structure it somewhere outside of the department will not take away that challenge. They're going to be faced with these issues regardless. And um, 
you know, we're always open to looking at what any of those options may be. But the nature of policing it has to face these social issues going forward. And I think that's what we're seeing in a lot of other places. So uh, structuring it differently won't, won't address that challenge. That's just simply going to be there. So with that, I'd, I'll turn it over to Chief uh, Deck Brown for her to announce the next steps that she is taking to try to grapple with these tough issues. So, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, greetings to Mayor and, and Council. As you recall, I did come before you several weeks ago uh, and spoke about this very issue. Uh, and at that time, uh, you may recall that I actually referenced around the uh, COVID-19 issues that when everyone else sheltered at home, the only folk left out there on the street very often that we responded to were our homeless uh, community, was our homeless community. At that time, I also referenced the resiliency and the innovation within the Raleigh Police Department, and it remains dead fast. But as our city manager has stated, this particular conversation and the possibility of a program like this uh, was actually born pre-COVID. And some of the homework had already been done um, from a research and benchmark marking perspective. So today I come before you to present that facet of in innovation of our team, as well as what I believe is truly embodied um, from a resilient standpoint within our organization. But more specifically, this topic today really speaks to the resilience and the empowerment of our homeless community. As you know, the city of Raleigh is steeped in a history, symbolism, and imagery surrounding its very own nickname, the City of Oak. As we began designing the program, the team brought much creativity to the table, not just in the work to be done and what it will look like and the service that is provided, but also in the name. And the attempt was to really evaluate and look at a name that was meaningful, iconic, and reflective not only of this city's historic symbolism, but reflective of the strength and the resilience that we see not only in the oak tree, but in the origin of the tree, the acorn. Not only is the acorn the seed of the sturdy oak, but acorns play an important and sustaining role in the ecological system as nourishment, but also its purpose is to sustain a sprouting seedling as it grows green in order to sustain itself and endure the challenges of its environment. Mayor and Council, I present to you ACORNS, an integrated and collaborative team approach to addressing crisis through outreach referrals, networking, and service. As we are aware of the impact of homelessness to both individuals and families, we see it magnified since the onset of COVID with so many other implications. Yet I stand here today optimistic that by establishing this type of service, like the Sturdy Oak, working with many of our service providers and community partners, we envision this process of growing together, standing strong, and weathering the storm. The concept of service, the concept of service is not unique to law enforcement. And this particular concept of service is not unique to law enforcement either. We are very deliberate in our benchmarking efforts to identify and research programs throughout the United States and Canada to determine where success is and has occurred. In fact, programs like this are born out of several factors, budget, 
resource gaps, the holistic approach to reduce homelessness, and other mental health related crises, just to name a few. Some of the programs that we looked at and reached out to are just a few years old. Some are 20 plus years, and one was over 50 years old. Locally, we have already begun the process of reaching out to a number of our community partners who are intricately connected in providing services and resources to address the varying issues surrounding homelessness and mental illness. The ACORNS team is designed to understand the need to foster growth, patience, relationships, and understanding while recognizing that the process itself can take time. With this approach and beyond the, the pro process, the ACORNS team will assist individuals with growing together, standing strong and collectively weathering that storm. Our mission is to connect with individuals in crisis and to provide them with the resources needed to meet their individual goals. As you may know, community partnerships, organizational transformation, and collaborative intelligence-led problem solving are also key components to community policing. This program is just one facet of community policing. It's much bigger than policing. By engaging our community stakeholders and committing personnel and resources and using data-driven approaches to understand the challenges our community faces, we hope to accomplish this mission. How do we do that? We do it through outreach, education, case management, on-call field services, investigation, and intervention. As such, referrals and calls for service will be responded to by a social worker and an officer premised on a care, safety first, enforcement last approach. As I mentioned, we do this through outreach. That really involves meeting people where they are and responding to crises with patience and understanding. These outreach efforts will also serve as a branch between communities, community partners, the individual, business owners, faith-based organization, non-governmental organizations, social and health services, and the criminal justice system to develop long-lasting partnerships and grow a system of communal support for individuals in need. It also includes education. And it comes down to educating individuals, agencies, law enforcement officers, community partners on the lived experiences of individuals impacted by homelessness, living with mental illness, and or living with substance use disorders and the challenges they face. We've already begun this process, as I mentioned, with our external stakeholders, partners, and other service providers. It includes field services, providing field services for individuals requesting services or experiencing the crisis, providing transportation for individuals requesting or accepting services from those community partners. There will be calls for service, but it will involve utilizing a care and safety first enforcement last approach. And it must model and reflect kindness, compassion, equity, and cultural competence. 
another component has to be case management. And this team approach will establish a platform of case management in order to assist individuals and families with finding available services from the community partners. The case management will also identify and help individuals with their needs and goals in order to create individual care plans. It reflects maintaining communication with individuals and community partners to discuss progress and evaluate care plans, as well as meeting the community partners to, meet, to, to discuss um, the best needs of the individual receiving the services in our community. In addition, there are the roles of intervention and investigation as we collaborate with agencies and community partners to assist individuals in need. Intervention and investigation services include, but are not limited to, reunification with family members, strategies to reduce recidivism, and assist transitioning to long-term stability. The team is made up of a supervising sergeant, one detective, three social workers, and three officers. And as we look at next steps, while there are some significant steps to be taken, I do think a great deal of, of the preliminary heavy lift has already occurred. And so by the end of the year, our timeline and next steps would include working closely with our city HR and our budget office, reallocating positions, and what that basically means is uh, transitioning police officer positions to social work positions posting and advertising internally and externally, which allows us to run two processes to identify the best candidates and the most qualified for these positions. And then selection and appointment, onboarding and training. And while some training will be available at the onset, but like Raleigh Police, training is constant and ongoing. And there will be partnership training that will occur with our community partners as well. And then the, the big work begins. So and in closing, as I mentioned before, there are many examples of similar programs around our country. And they are born out of police departments. And although we sought best practices, my hope is that we can find and create examples of where we're even better than that. In many ways, our city is a beacon of innovation and ingenuity. And this project, this initiative, this program, and this effort will take an entire village. Together, we can plant the seeds of growth. We can nurture the soil of sustenance. And we can safeguard the fragility of the young sapling and watch it mature into a sturdy and mighty oak. And collectively, we will find ourselves growing together, standing strong, and weathering the storm. Thank you. Are there any questions? Excellent presentation, um, Chief. Um, we have Councillor Melton and then Councillor Cox. Yes, thank you. Um, Chief, you mentioned that um, when coming up with this um, program that we, you met with external partner stakeholders and service providers. So I was just wondering um, what groups were um, involved in the process in coming up with this proposal? Can you repeat part of your question? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, so you mentioned that the department met with external partners, stakeholders, and service providers. So I was just curious which groups or what types of um, input did you receive? From the foundation, actually, is how it started um, in really reaching out to those organizations, first of all, who have 
uh, similar programs. As you all may recall from the last meeting, uh, I believe you all suggested different um, organizations by which to research and benchmark. So we did that as well, including CAHOOTS, Councilor Cox. Um, with that being said, um, we stood this up and then have been communicating with the area stakeholders um, as they have become aware of what we're doing and bringing um, just a variety of those service providers to the table. And we have received uh, a tremendous amount of um, support. Uh, we have received suggestions on training. Uh, we have um, really been asked the overall question from those sources, what can we help you uh, to do in order to be successful at this? Okay, and then the second piece I have, and I understand I have some background noise. Are you able to hear me? Um, I think the podium is actually muted now, Chief. Um, but the second piece, so if I understand then the intent is to shift funding from sworn officer positions to civilian mental health positions. Is, is, that, is that what you're doing with this program? Yes. And so I guess the only thing I would point out was when I was looking at the material, I do think that we need to be re-examining how we care for our most vulnerable residents and that often when you call for help you don't need a sworn officer with a badge and gun to, to show up sometimes you, you a civilian mental health professional is probably a better way to approach certain situations so i would just point out that when i looked at the material i noticed that the number of mental health professionals in the proposed unit is equal to the number of sworn officers and so if there were any way to allocate or shift more positions to civilian mental health professionals, I think that that would um, that would be my preference. That's all I have. Thank you. Well, to answer your question, I'll say two things. Um, we are serving a city of half a million people in the city of Raleigh with a variety of needs, wants, and wishes when we respond to all calls of service. What may not be recognized is more often than not, when we do respond, uh, those situations are rendered safe and individuals are taken to the necessary care facility that, that they need to go to. When you are talking about mental health, uh, there are certain things, particularly when it comes to commitment processes that are required for escort um, by law enforcement. Um, the partnership, I think, allows us to evaluate all of the above and recognize the various resources. I, I don't think this is as simple from our conversations with the many people that we have talked to. Um, it's not as simple as perhaps people think that it is. It is very complex. Part of the reason why you have a detective is to further evaluate and work with um, our district attorney where there may be a situation for um, diverting a person through the, through the system. So there are so many layers to a process like this. And the encounters that we, we have and engage on a regular basis um, really do and are reflective of rendering uh, safe calls for service. Um, quite often you have officers uh, and many of our counselors have requested officers downtown. They encounter and work with our, our homeless community on a regular basis. And I do go back to COVID once again. Uh, at the onset of COVID, when everyone else was sheltering at home, you may recall me saying, um, you really got to see the trees because the forest had disappeared because everyone else was at home. And, and we received calls for they're sitting on the steps of a closed business. They're urinating in the park. There were no facilities for them to go to. So uh, law enforcement and these officers, I do believe, have a purpose. The other part to that, sir, is we are recruiting on a regular basis. And as you can imagine, in light of where we are across the country, and this didn't happen at the onset of the unfortunate death 
of Mr. Floyd. But even before that, it has been challenging and more challenging to recruit for law enforcement. So that is an ongoing process as well because of all of the other calls for service that we have in this city. Chief, I believe you're muted. Are there any other questions? Councillor Cox had a question. Uh, yes, Chief, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned uh, CAHOOTS, and that's a program in, in Eugene, Oregon, and it falls under an organization called White Bird Clinic. Uh, in your examination of CAHOOTS, uh, is White Bird Clinic integrated as part of uh, the Eugene, Oregon Police Department, or is that a separate organization? If I recall, I think it may have started that way. I, I, I can follow up and give you some additional information. Um, Mr. Cox, that is probably one of the most elaborate programs uh, that is out there, which is probably why it has existed for over 50 years. Um, what they also have is um, they, they, they have the clinic. They have all of the other residual services that assist someone who is dealing with the mental health crisis. Um, it is really a continuum of care on so many levels. I don't think that it was it was created on that platform. I think over the 50 years they have evolved into what we what we see now. Okay. So there's a lot to learn from there, I guess. Um, yes, sir. Is, which is so why I guess maybe this is more of a question for the city manager than the police chief. It is that in looking at the White Bird Clinic and the Cahoots program, um, that might not be something that would fall under the police department. Um, but it does seem to me, and this is me acting as a counselor, so you can take my. Uh, Um, that I think the community is looking for something like Wiper Clinic and the CAHOOTS program. And so I'm wondering if we can look at this in more detail. The chief referred to a continuum of care. Can we identify what, what that means uh, by continuum of care, what services are provided? And what would be the gaps that we would have to fill here in Raleigh in order to move in that direction? Yeah, I'd be happy to respond to that, Mr. Cox. And at one point, I think your your video froze up a little bit, so I didn't hear all your question, but I'm going to take a guess at it. And if I'm wrong, you can clarify. Okay. So some of these comparisons to other cities across the country also fall into differences associated with their governmental and public and health structures. Mm -hmm. So in North Carolina, a lot of the social services and mental health providers pretty much all come from the, the county and the state in whatever city you're in. Okay. Uh, social service types of functions and programs up until recently is something that cities were generally not involved with at all. Uh, and, and where that started to sort of shift a little bit is in that affordable housing category, in the homelessness category, in the mental health category. So we're sort of, by the way, um, North Carolina cities and counties are structured with the state creeping into and moving into space that has traditionally not been where cities have served. And some of that is what the chief mentioned in terms of that continuum of care and where it is. So, for example, locally here, there's a group that meets about once a month that is convened and operated by Wake County and the district attorney called the Wake County Directors Group that has providers from the hospital system, from Wake County Social Services, from the criminal justice system, uh, from mental health providers, things like that, because that's where all the services live currently for those functions. Mm -hmm. um, police has uh, traditionally been um, the, the first point of contact and then either the transport or the connection for a lot of those folks. So when you start talking about comparisons, like for example, CAHOOTS, some of those services were in another agency or within that city that were directly being provided. So that's when we talk about the structures. Um, 
uh, in terms of continuum of care, where does that next, where the, like, for example, where is the, where are the beds? Where are the doctors? Where are the social service workers? So interfacing with the infrastructure that is here locally with the Wake County, with Wake County or with the state of North Carolina is as important as a conversation about standing up our own services. That, that, that's really what the difference is or what we're, you know, what we're talking about. Um, does that answer, am I answering your question? Well, only partly. I mean, the CAHOOTS program, based on my reading, is really about first responders to um, mental health crises. And so it's a program to respond to those kinds of crises. Now, whether here in North Carolina, that in Raleigh, that should reside with the city or with the weight or with the county, I guess that's something that we can have some discussions with the county about and with the state. But it seems like, in my view, this is what the community is asking for, it is a program that's similar to CAHOOTS, that is independently administered and provides first-line response to mental health crisis. It works in collaboration with the police department, but doesn't fall under the police department. Sure, certainly. Well, if, if, the, if the council would like to move in that direction, let's say the, the, that, the, that the policy direction from the council was to stand up a separate function, Let's just say that for hypothetical purposes, I think we'd have to really grapple or deal with two things. First of all is resources, is funding. Um, because I think what we're trying here with the chief's uh, approach is to leverage the resources we have to maximize the relationship with the existing service providers. So if we want to go with an independent or a different unit, the, the, the first thing is that's gonna cost a lot more money, I think, just in terms of a separate agency. The second thing you're gonna to have to, I think we're gonna to have to deal with is that response and that responder in terms of calls for service and what does that look and feel like? So there's another big discussion that's occurring among cities on this question of, and the chief could speak to this way better than I could, what is a call for service that the police would handle versus what is a call for service that the mental health provider would, would handle? And it sounds simple, but when you're the dispatcher on the phone call, it's not always clear which it is. So, so often yeah. that, you know, often that responder then it evolves and, and, and learns once they get on the ground. So that CAHOOTS model, they've spent a lot of time elaborately in a smaller place trying to discern what type of call it is. So, well, and that, that would be my point. That would be my point is that we have 30 to 50 years worth of experience to draw upon so we don't have to uh, start all over with infrastructure. Hey, I have two counselors with their hands raised um, Mayor Pro Tem and then Councillor Stewart. Yeah, so Cahoots is part of the, yeah, so Cahoots is part of the White Bird Agency, which is basically a continuum of care. In the community and it's part of the lane county crisis intervention services so it looks like cahoots is part of a group a, another nonprofit that the county which offers services in um oregon in eugene oregon sponsors so i think it goes to i'm saying this to, to say it goes to the point where i think this is a, this first start for the city but as we move forward um let's have a conversation with the county, which provides health services, so we can look at crisis management overall for the county. Um, Raleigh it is the majority of the county, granted, but this issue is a county issue. It's a national issue. Um, so I agree with Councilman Cox and what the demand and the requests are from the community. I think the next step is us working with our county commissioners and getting our city manager and county managers working and departments working on a long-term fix. I think this is how we get started as they probably started in Lane County 50 years ago. I'm 42, I have no idea what they did 50 years ago. But as we move forward, let's work together. Councilor Stewart. Thank you. Um, Chief, one of the things that's kind of coming to mind with Council Member Cox's um, and Mayor Pratam Branch's comments is this idea of um, when we're intaking these calls or at our 911 center, it, I'm wondering um, what kind of thought has gone into 
making sure that those folks, that that department is ready to field these. Um, and I think it also gets to what uh, Mayor Pro Tem Branch is talking about with coordination among our county and even statewide partners um, when we're responding to calls. Um, so just want, if you can touch a little bit on our 911 call center and kind of their response to what we're putting together today. My conversation as it relates to the 911 call center is going to be limited uh, as that is a different department. However, like they do now, um, they triage the call for lack of a better way of, of, of speaking to it. Uh, and it is in that moment because our 911 center is actually, um, it's sort of a joint operation center where we have individuals in the call center that answer for other jurisdictions. So they would go through some type of a screening process uh, and and be able to discern the type of call and who needs to go to it. Um, they they triage calls when before they dispatch an officer, um, even now, and, and other units. They determine what the nature of the call is so that they can best inform the respondents to that call what to expect when they get there. It's not perfect by any stretch. Um, and, and we recently had a, uh, a situation where a, an individual was, had barricaded himself and after a protracted period of time with our officers, um, because he had also um, injured uh, the person who was in the house and shot at our officers, um, but we, over a period of time, rendered that call safe uh, and got the, the person in the house, the victim, to where she needed to go um, and, and addressed his needs as well. But um, that's how most of them end. In, in in most situations, those calls are rendered safe. But the way the call initially went out uh, evolved. And so by the time the officers get there, which is very common, it changes. And when you are dealing with uh, a mental health crisis, it is an evolving situation until um, it is brought to a solution or resolution. Okay, thank you. Councilor Knight, did you have a question? Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief. Uh, this is definitely very timely and, and helpful. Um, a, a data question first, and then a question on how this would work in practice. Um, what, what is the percentage of uh, citizen engagements or interactions by the police force in Raleigh that deals with mental health issues? Do you all have that broken down or categorize that? That way we do. We'll, we do. We'll have to get it to you. Okay. Um, I I don't have that data with me today, but yes, we do. Okay. And then, based on that, a little bit, how did you determine the the number of um, folks that would work with this in within this team, and then what their positions are? How did y'all come up determine that? Is it based on what you thought the level of response would be needed for this team. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how you came up with this, this, the team as it is indicated here on your email slot. We did assess our, our data. Uh, we looked at the types of calls. Um, a combination of things went into that. No single department had a, a um, a, a shoe that, that actually fit the needs of Raleigh. Uh, and so, um, after looking at what we had before us as it related to what we're dealing with, and I will say, depending on the type of circumstances and the situation, it's more than just the two-person team. Um, if, as you can imagine, the, the call that I just referenced, by the time um, all of what's on scene um, from commanders to the lowest ranking officer, as well as working with our police psychologists and a number of other resources, you have quite a few people in that type of, of an event um, on your, your day to day. Um, in, in most instances today, our officers respond to, to the mental health crisis that occur in this city every day. Um, and so evaluating what we had, 
um, to work with in terms of our calls for service, having those conversations with um, organizations uh, like Cahoots. They send they send a two two person team out um, because what you what sometimes happens is um, those situations when the families are calling those situations are already escalating. So our goal is to de-escalate that situation, but it is also to make sure that no one is injured uh, in that in that environment as well. Um, based on what we had, based on what uh, we heard through the benchmarking, um, this was our initial approach at addressing this, uh, given the very limited resources that we have within our organization. And thank you. And last, in the process of a call coming in and receiving that information, who or where that process would you determine if this team would go out as part of the first response? Or do you see this more as a not a first responder team that they would be following up based on what an officer found at the scene or dealt with at the scene? Or do you see that these this team is part, generally, normally part of the first response. I, th I see this team uh, being multifaceted. It's not just responding, but it's also working on and, and identifying the additional resources. As I talked about case management, it's also there's a follow-up piece to this. It's more than just identifying the fact that we have someone who is mentally ill or someone who is homeless in a crisis or a need, but then what? And so that's why you, you, you heard so many other different pieces to it. And that's been our conversation with our service provider partners um, throughout the community. Um, I don't know that, well, I, I'm not aware of this in our area at all. Um, and so this is our initial approach at that, but also recognizing um, what that looks like from a holistic approach is having to reach out to all of those different providers that we are, through experience as well, familiar with the various facets and phases that a person goes through. This is why we also, uh, I referenced the criminal justice system. There are times where this involves the criminal justice system. So taking a holistic and broad approach as to who can be at the table, who needs to be at the table, and how we approach the situation and the circumstances with that individual, I think is is how we looked at it. We, we didn't look at it in one space, but we looked at, um, based on what we heard from the benchmarking, but what we also know from a day-to-day -day basis, um, the various encounters and the many different partners who work with us in dealing with um, situations involving our homeless and our mental health, uh, uh, our, our mentally ill community on a regular basis. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, um, I just want to say one of the things that I think this is intended to do is to um, create collaboration. We have a number of organizations um, who um, support our members of our homeless community and those who are mentally ill. And it's the collabor collaboration piece that's going to make this work. It's the referrals, it's getting people channel to those organizations, whether it's Healing Transitions or Oak City Cares. Um, but, you know, I, I'm very um, grateful, Chief, for the research that you all have done and looking at the programs that um, we, some of the programs we had discussed that um, are operating other areas of the country very successfully. So this is a first step and I will look forward to learning more as we move forward. So thank you. Okay, next special item is outdoor seating in NX zoning districts.
Thank you, Chief. Hi, Ken Bowers from Planning and Development. Um, while we wait for the slides to show up, this item was originally a referral from Planning Commission and you asked for a report back and we provided a memo in your backup and I'm going to go through it. Fairly large number of slides which I'll go through quickly in the interest of time. Um, just a little history, when the UDO was first drafted, uh, bars were not, or night home taverns and lounges, places that get 70% or more of their um, revenue from uh, from drinks, uh, were not allowed in the annex district. And um, we were uh, asked to do a text change um, uh, into that, of that would that would change that and allow those bars in the annex zoning district. and. Uh, Mayor Baldwin, you may remember during the remapping, part of what drove that was that we were putting CX instead of NX on a lot of commercial properties that had a bar in, in them at the time. And there was a desire to use NX more frequently, and this would allow that to happen. Because there were still concerns about potential adverse impacts from bars in close proximity to residential, some use regulations were added to that. Um, the annex district itself is generally mapped for commercial areas that are tend to be closer in proximity to residential and are designed to have lower um, impact commercial uses. So in order to deal with the impacts, three use standards were added to bars as a limited use in the annex district. There was a prohibition on live performances, a prohibition on dance floors, and a limitation on the total number of outdoor seats, which was pegged at eight, I am told, because that was the number of outdoor seats at the GOAT on Western Boulevard and Powell Drive. Um, the, uh, the, we were asked to look at standard three, um, we have three options for you, and upon uh, further reflection, since the memo is transmitted, I'm going to modify uh, our recommendation a little bit to you. But the first option was simply to remove that third standard, allowing an unlimited number of outdoor seats. And recall, this is about outdoor seating on the bar property itself, not in the public right of way, which is a separate issue. So they could be of any size, um, and that, would, of course, would be very the most flexible approach. But since large numbers of people outdoor conversing does have a noise impact, if that was very close to someone's home, there would potential be there would be potential for outdoor for um, adverse impacts from that noise. Um, second option is to take the eight and make it something higher. So, for example, eight outdoor seats is like two four tops. If we were to triple that, you could have 24 outdoor seats. That would still be a modestly sized outdoor seating area, but not in, not one of unlimited size. And then the third option we um, maintain was, well, you know, since we're really concerned about impacts on residential, maybe we only apply these use standards to where the bar is actually close enough to residential for there to be a, an ad, adverse noise impact. Um, and our recommendation in the memo was to do was to do number three. Now, the key thing is, uh, are we looking at distances from any residential use or residential uses that are in a residential zoning district? And the difference is, of course, is that the NX is a mixed use district, and so residential is a principal permitted use in all those districts. So there's likely to be a mix of uses in some of our NX districts. and. Many, many more properties would be impacted if you made the spacing requirement off of a residential use as opposed to a residential zoning district. It also would raise the specter that if a residential use came in and was developed after the fact, it would render someone's outdoor seating area non-conforming. So um, what we suggested originally was a spacing requirement of 200 feet. Upon further reflection, 200 feet is probably a very large number. If you look at um, some of our classic NX districts, like those strung along Hillsborough Street, they're only 100 to 150 feet deep, and you have to get into much larger NX areas, typically mapped over shopping centers, like, say, the Food Lion Plaza on um, Western Boulevard inside the Beltline to get uh, to find NX districts that are of sufficient size that there would be a significant amount of the property that was more than 200 feet from a residential zoning district. So 
I think um, if we we're going to pursue the spacing approach as opposed to just changing the standard blanket across NX districts, we would probably have to look at a smaller number somewhere between 50 and 100 feet for spacing um, and to key it to residential district as opposed to residential uses generally. We were also asked uh, in the memo to sort of summarize the amplified entertainment regulations. Not really a lot of intersection between these standards, but um, if you have a lot of outdoor seating, there's probably more of a desire to put some sort of outdoor speaker system. And we, I, we uh, define outdoor entertainment as any type of music or entertainment generated through an electronic system other than TVs operating solely on their internal speakers and background music systems operated at a lower volume. Um, there are exemptions for schools, churches, and uh, uh, when the when it's uh, four or fewer times a year that the system is in operation. We also have the special uh, hospitality districts. Basically, Glenwood South is our hospitality district. Um, the specifies hours in which amplified sound can be played, the location of speakers, and the volume. So it's a more detailed set of regulations in any hospitality district. Um, outdoor amplified. Uh, Entertainment may only be played uh, for occasional events as permitted by the city manager and only one of these events at any given establishment in a year. So um, uh, outside of the hospitality districts, doing outdoor music uh, requires a special use permit granted by the city council. Um, and again, there's a few exemptions for that. Uh, if you have a stadium or arena with special use permit, obviously there's going to be amplified sound associated with the stadium or arena use. Um, shopping centers of a certain size, think about the music that plays, say, in North Hills. Um, that's an exemption, parades, and then events on public property that are sponsored or co-sponsored by the city. So with that, I'm uh, free to take any questions. Councillor Cox. I would be interested in knowing in District B, for example, how many NX districts they are, there are and how close they are to uh, residential districts. I know of a few, yep. and I'm, I would be concerned about, I'm particularly interested in the uh, amplified music uh, regulations. What are our current amplified music regulations for outdoor sound, or amplified sound outdoor at, in NX districts yep. currently? Well, again, it, they're not regulated by zoning district. It's a separate permitting process. And outside of the hospitality districts and the exemptions I regulated, there is a special use permit process to get amplified entertainment, which is heard by the council. So they would have to come in, and you would have to conduct a quasi-judicial uh, hearing in order to approve it. And, and are you proposing to continue that process, or are you proposing a trial? We have not proposed any changes to the current process. Um, we have not had any issues with the process brought to us recently. The last time the process was modified was when the city you know, did the pilot of a hospitality district. And if you could go back to the one slide that talked about the 200 feet, um, I'm a little confused about that. Well, you, you asked about um, existing NX districts. NX is really commonly mapped on older retail streets. We find NX on P Street. We find it on Hillsborough Street. We find it on portions of Western Boulevard. Okay, we well, find it on a I mean, they're, they're out here what? in the suburbs. They're out here in the suburbs. I have one in Dunn Road, which is directly across the street from residential homes. So I want to understand right. what the impact of these changes would be on, on those neighborhoods. Could I make a suggestion? Yes. Um, could, could we take this into the self um, vibrant and healthy um, neighborhood committee for further review? Um, the Long Public Safety um, Committee, we actually looked at the whole hospitality district. Um, so I think ha um, having a little bit more of a discussion so we understand the implications could be helpful. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. Can I see some heads nodding? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, then that's what we'll do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ken. 
All right, and next we have micromobility e-scooter definition. After this, I'm gonna call for a brief break. Um, we've been sitting now since one o'clock. I think we need to kind of stretch a little bit. Then we'll get into the report and recommendation of the city manager. So, um, Michael. Oh, good afternoon. And in, in the interest of time and in the interest of, since I'm the only thing standing between you and a break, uh, I'll try to be brief here today. Since we've also had a lot of discussion about this in the past, I'll wait for my presentation to come up. So today we're here before you to, to present a couple of redefinitions or a redefinition and a new definition of micromobility and to ask uh, your passage of an ordinance that would help us uh, along that, help us to be a little bit more nimble and agile in our administration of uh, the micromobility industry here in Raleigh. Um, our current definition uh, was put together quickly back when scooters were first introduced into the city. Um, they were put together uh, so that we would have an ability to allow them in bike lanes because at that time uh, a motorized vehicle or a motor vehicle was not allowed in uh, bike lanes. So we put this together rather quickly. Here is our new definition. It basically provides a little bit broader definition, a little bit more flexibility, and it includes, again, um, basically very similar things that we're seeing uh, in other communities nationwide, uh, just in terms of a, a broader definition to work from. We also include in this ordinance uh, a definition of a micromobility device that helps us in our administration of uh, for hire uh, vehicles, basically the industry that we see here with uh, Gotcha today. Uh, it would also help us with Citric Cycle and were, say, Line Bike ever to be re reintroduced, it would help along that line as well. And again, this is a very broad definition that's meant to uh, allow for innovation in the industry and for us to be able to be a little bit more nimble and agile. So if we ever to see uh, the sort of one-wheel skateboards that you may see downtown a little bit, those through a for-rental uh, approach, uh, it would be helpful if we had a, a broad definition like this. It's not really meant to apply to those personal vehicles that you see. Uh, I know you've seen folks around with motorized skateboards and things like that. We are not going to be asking for encroachment agreements on every uh, component of micromobility we see out there. But this is, again, for us to be able to uh, address some of the things that we're seeing in the industry. The other action that's included in this ordinance is a, a delegation authority to the city manager to develop guidelines and then to enter into those uh, encroachment agreements that we've got with the various providers. Uh, so this, again, helps us be a little bit more quick and agile to adjust to the marketplace and to what we're seeing in the industry. Uh, so for next steps, we would request that you would pass this ordinance today, and then we will also be bringing forward at the 27th Transportation and Transit Committee uh, proposed revisions to the existing encroachment agreements so that we'd have different encroachment agreement going forward to address some of the things that we've explored through that committee's work so far. And then we would also have um, kind of a, a, what we would see would we'll go into a request for proposals that we would be prepared uh, to solicit uh, uh, responses to uh, just as quickly as we can following that. So with that, I'd have, uh, be happy to entertain any questions you have, and uh, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Council um, Branch, may I put that? I, I definitely support this. I do want like to offer one slight change or modification that has to do with the city manager's um, is authorized, could it be the city manager or his designee um, is authorized um, to um, develop guidelines for operations of micromobility devices within the city, dots as stated, so on. Um, if no one else has any comments, I would like to make a motion to approve um, the moving forward with that modification. Do we have a second? Councilor Melton has seconded that. All in favor? Opposed? Okay, um, clerk, that is passed unanimously. Okay, if everybody will mute and go, um, yeah, and get rid of your video, um, we're going to take five minutes.
Memphis City Manager. Um, first, we have up Derek Reamer um, from the Office of Emergency Management to talk to us about a the COVID update and special events. Derek. Yes, Mayor, members of council, while we're getting the presentation up here, uh, good to see you all. Uh, welcome, Council Member Fort. Uh, again, my name is Derek Reamer. I'm with Emergency Management and Special Events. I'm going to give you uh, our COVID-19 update today, touch a little bit on special events, talk about the uh, mask project we've been working on for vulnerable populations, and then close it off uh, with just a, a slide or two talking about hurricane season and how we're going to address that in a COVID-19 world. Uh, to begin, uh, Wake County numbers here, a uh, little over uh, 12,700 cases uh, and 185 deaths here in Wake County. When you look at the trends, if you follow those red bars there, our daily case count has actually uh, seemingly gone down over the past couple of days, which is a good thing. And you see that uh, also at the state level, if you look at the yellow line there, our overall number of cases on that seven-day rolling average is, is trending downward. Uh, when we look at our hospitalizations, they still remain fairly flat. Um, this is a, a, another indicator that we use, and, and, and while maybe showing a little bit of a tick words downward, uh, it's still looking fairly flat. Uh so pivot a little bit, I want to talk about uh, special events and uh, some cancellations we have to, uh, to ensure that we're still remaining safe here in the city. So as a reminder, uh, we are in phase two of North Carolina's uh, reopening plan and uh, the mass gathering restrictions associated with that are uh, going to continue until uh, at least September 11th, and that is the limitation of 10 people indoors and no more than 25 people outdoors. And when possible, we try to align with the the state's recommendations on there. However, we can uh, uh, be a little bit more restrictive if we need to. The current status of special events in Raleigh, if you recall, uh, a couple weeks ago when we spoke, uh, we canceled all festivals, road races, and parades through October 31st. Um, and since that time, we've continued to have conversations with event organizers in November and December to make sure that they're aware uh, should we need to uh, cancel them through the end of the year. Uh, factors uh, that we took into consideration, uh, students are heading back to school, uh, coming flu season, uh, continued guidance from the CDC and DHHS, and really just take it into the overall safety and well-being of the community. Uh, another important note is really the decision to cancel these events uh, several months ahead of time allows event organizers to conserve their resources and focus on uh, doing things that, uh, you know, like a virtual event, uh, so make sure they have the money and the, the time to plan for that. So we want to give them as much notice as possible. Additionally, several events in November, uh, big uh, high pro higher profile events have already decided to cancel or go virtual, including the City of Oaks Marathon, the Veterans Day Parade, and the Christmas Parade. Uh, those events that remained on the calendar uh, are waiting for our guidance and direction on that, which we bring to you today. Uh, so if you'll recall, when we last met, uh, we decided that uh, we would bring you a recommendation no later than September 1st uh, on the disposition of events beyond October 31st. So we're here today with a couple weeks early to go ahead and get that decision out and allow event organizers to plan accordingly. So our proposal, and again, this is a uh, administrative action. It doesn't require any action from council. Uh, however, we do want to make sure that you have the ability to provide any comments or uh, feedback to us. Uh, but all festivals, road races, and parades would be canceled through at least uh, December 31st, and, and that includes any and all uh, New Year's Eve celebrations. Uh, the cancellation does not include uh, Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources program uh, or anything at the Raleigh Convention and Performing Arts Center. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is uh, when we're talking about special events and special events cancellations, we're often talking about uh, general admission events where there's just throbs of people crowded together with no real way to uh, separate them or control access. Uh, if, if we get to a point where uh, legally allowed parks, recreation, and cultural resources, for instance, could have some type of recreation programming uh, where they can limit the number of people, they can spread people out, they can do temperature checks and things like that. Uh, so that's why we have a slightly 
different uh, decision path as we go down this. And then also we will take into account uh, any events with 25 or less attendees. Uh, but really the goal there is looking at neighborhood block parties, something maybe akin to uh, the expanded outdoor dining we have where we want to provide additional space for, for neighbors to get out and, and spread out since everybody's cooped up inside for so long. So when we look at uh, what this might affect, uh, here's a list of the, the, some of the major ones. There, there are others in there, uh, but first night, uh, Milk Bar's annual Milk Fest, the downtown Raleigh food truck rodeo, the tree lighting ceremony, and the Jingle Bell Run, uh, to name a few. So I'll pivot for a minute now, and I want to talk a little bit about our mask project for vulnerable populations. Uh, this is a project we talked about briefly as a pilot project with Wake Med, Wake County, and the city of Raleigh, although I'd be remiss not to thank the tons and tons of other sponsors and, and groups out there that have helped with this. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them. Uh, but the idea was to use money from the CARES Act to distribute face masks and provide educational materials to our uh, disproportionately uh, uh, population who are exposed to poverty, unemployment, and other quality of life changes, challenges. So the, the pilot began down in 27610, uh, which has uh, around uh, 82,000 residents. Um, and then at the time, the most uh, COVID cases in the county and the fourth highest number in the state. So it was a great area to start and to focus our effort. And our goal was to distribute uh, 30,000 masks to 10,000 people. And we succeeded in that and went over a little bit by distributing 32,000 masks. Uh, the fire department, uh, just as an example, held three events uh, where uh, 6,000 masks were distributed. The police department did 4,000 at an event at Roberts Park. And Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources during their summer camps uh, also distributed a number of masks. So as we look to phase two of this, because it was so successful in phase one, we'll expand into additional zip codes. And so far we have over 16 events scheduled uh, where we hope to distribute at least 26,000 additional masks. Uh, an event this weekend actually at Southeast Raleigh High School put on by the police department, we hope to distribute a, a, a solid 6,000 there. And then finally, my third pivot here uh, for the day, I just want to talk a little bit about hurricane season as it will be a little bit different this year, mainly uh, because of COVID, but also because there is a great increase in activity out in the Atlantic. Uh, not to get too science and technical here, uh, although I tend to enjoy it, uh, it's going to be a, a busier year than normal. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are watching this, um, keeping track of it. Um, and so, you know, hurricane preparedness during a pandemic is going to be a little bit different. Uh, there's different challenges there and uh, how we deal with our populations, but also how we as a city uh, respond. I think it's important to point uh, the citizens uh, to uh, some resources we have out there. The readync.org site is a, a great resource that provides information on, on a whole range of topics, including hurricane preparedness in a pandemic. Um, but also our uh, Ready Raleigh Emergency Preparedness Guide is available online that has some, some good areas and can direct people to, to service areas that they may have questions about during a hurricane or any other type of emergency. Uh, at the staff level, we had our uh, annual hurricane preparedness training. Uh, uh, just last week. And, uh, you know, what that does is focus on our emergency operations center. I just want to talk a little bit about that and just mention that because it's, it's really where all of the city departments come together and where we all coordinate during an event. Um, you can see some of the metrics there on when we, when we would open that up or some of the uh, past times we've opened it up during the pandemic or Hurricane Dorian last year. Uh, we even did a virtual one during ESIAS. But the point is all of our city departments come together and we as a city collaborate uh, to make sure that we are ready to respond to uh, anything that might come our way regarding hurricane season uh, and this year, especially in the middle of a pandemic. So I know that was uh, three different topics there, but I would be happy to take any questions that you might have on any of them. Thank you, Derek. Um, I have, I see a couple of hands, but I have two questions that I just want to ask. One is about the events. This really then applies to events we permit. 
Yes, these are for uh, events that are out on the streets. You would typically see, typically see those big festivals and, and parties out on the streets, large gatherings. This does not uh, deal with private property. This does not uh, deal with parks, recreation, and cultural resources sites to so the Performing Arts Center. And it certainly has no effect on our uh, expanded outdoor dining uh, uh, efforts that we've been working on in those efforts. So uh, this is really just those, those festivals and parties we typically see in downtown. Okay, great, thank you. And then the second question is about the mask program, which I think is a great program. Thank you for taking the initiative, um, leadership on that and collaborating with so many of our partners. One request I have um, is to in ensure that we are reaching our Hispanic communities. Um, that has, th this virus first attacked African-American populations and our senior citizens. And what we've seen after that is um, our Hispanic community. So I just want to make um, that request to ensure that we are looking, looking out for them as well in a very proactive way. And now, do I have any other? Absolutely. OK. Um, Councilor Knight. Did you say Knight? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, going back to the special events um, and the uh, recommendation to cancel through the new year, um, in, or at least by September 1, I believe, um, that you're gonna make that final decision or want to. One thought is to make that final decision after we know what, what, what phase we're going into after September 11, possibly, um, to give you a little more time. And are we looking at possible options, alternatives to being flexible and nimble about maybe being able to carry out some of these virtually, like the, you know, or, or with no audience, such as the lighting, the downtown tree lighting ceremony, or some other events that may go around um, the, the holidays in particular that you could do without audiences or do virtually. That's just a, a thought. So, yeah, absolutely. And and the decision uh, do, doesn't affect anything along those lines. Uh, the the Christmas parade is a great example where they've already decided to to go virtual this year. Um, so this wouldn't preclude anything like this from happening. What this is really focusing on is limiting mass gatherings in, in downtown and other areas of the city. We just want to reduce that 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 community spread and, and that spread of the virus from 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 folks. And so it doesn't preclude any thinking outside of the box like virtual events or anything like that. That. Yeah, and um, okay. Councillor Knight, just I have spoken with the folks from First Night. They are not doing a live event, but they are working with WREL and looking at something potentially a drive through type of program or um, a virtual type of program. But one thing they have promised is there will be some type of um, acorn drop, um, and that's probably going to be virtual, but we got to continue the Raleigh tradition. Council Branch. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation and all the information, especially around masks. I do have a question about on slide 11, um, where we talk about special events. Um, events with 25 attendees or less, we're saying will be considered for permitting. I'm just trying to get clarification. Yeah, so those events, uh, we, we don't want to go uh, and say that absolutely nothing can happen, uh, but those smaller events, and again, we, we're really focusing this on, on neighborhood block parties um, and, and smaller events like that to per, uh, promote community and, and giving people some space to, to get out of their, their houses and get out on the streets. So think of the shared space initiative we have, uh, something uh, akin to that, not necessarily uh, programming and, and, and festival environments, but just uh, open space where, where neighborhoods can go out that you know might have uh, not a lot of open space that could come into a, a block party and, and be able to spread out a little bit okay thank you okay counselor counselor fort good afternoon uh one of the questions that i have um for staff um, to maybe get some information and follow up with us later um, would be about additional testing sites throughout the city um, I don't know if you have any information about that or could, you know, pull some information information together about the possibility of 
us having some additional um, COVID testing sites, especially for our more vulnerable communities um, and, and have those dispersed throughout um, some of our areas with our higher risk populations. Sure. Um, uh, the testing uh, is, is typically a, a county function. Uh, again, going back to a little bit of Ruffin mentioned earlier on kind of the division of responsibilities, uh, a lot of that lies with the county. But uh, I can certainly work and, and get a, a report and kind of show what they're doing and the efforts that they're doing and see if there's some opportunities for us to enhance that. Absolutely. We can take care of that for you. Okay. Thank you. Any, any additional questions? Okay, thank you, Derek. Thank you for your continued hard work. Okay, next we have um, item two, remote electronic format for the remainder of the um, year through 2020. And I guess that's um, Lou who will be, or will the city well. be doing this? Right, and we'll just make this very quick, Mayor. Uh, we don't have a presentation or anything. This is, again, um, as we continue to look at the calendar moving forward, and similar to the event issues, um, the proposal is to go ahead and indicate the uh, desire to, to stay in virtual meetings through the end of the calendar year for council meetings and boards and commissions. Really, the, the benefit of that is to allow for planning and communications and, um, so that folks can get used to that. We can continue to enhance our ability to do that effectively. The council could always undo that at some particular point. And even when we go into phase two, I'm sorry, if the state were to go into phase three, those in, indoor interior restrictions are still gonna limit the number of mass gatherings. I couldn't put, put a number on it. I don't know how many that is, but it's probably some number around 50. And so, you, and you're still supposed to be six feet apart and. So the logistics of going indoors, even under phase three, are going to be such that it's going to be very difficult. So our suggestion is for the purposes of communicating to the public is go ahead and indicate virtual meetings through uh, the end of December of the calendar year. And I don't know that it requires a motion. Uh, the calendar dates are not changing, but attached in your packet is a new calendar in terms of what that looks like. Um, clerk? Gail, you're Gail. muted. Gail. It's just been pointed out on the list you received in the agenda packet, the very last line indicates that the Transportation and Transit Committee meets on the fourth Tuesday. That should be corrected to the fourth Thursday uh, whenever you consider this. or. When you don't consider it should be corrected to the fourth Thursday. <laughs> Thank you. So we don't need a motion on this. This is this. Um, you know, uh, just so I can get some consensus from the council members or thumbs up. Are we good with this? Okay. All right. Um, we can reconsider um, if anything changes. So thank you. And then. Some of our boards and commissions who have not met, can we make sure that they do meet? I'm thinking um, maybe perhaps the Raleigh Convention um, Center Commission and others who weren't on the top priority at first. I yes, think- well, the, Yes, Mayor, if I could. That, that's one of the points of this is to give that direction. Yes. So that, so that then we can plan for it. I mean, our goals has been, if you don't have to meet, you know, don't don't force it, but we can now plan for that over the next several months and get them to convene and manage our workload. So that is the purpose of this. Okay, thank you. All right, the next item is the Atlantic Avenue Improvement Project. Mayor, as uh, staff is coming forward on this particular item, this is Kenneth Ritchie from Engineering Services. This is uh, our typical practice is to review the design of a project with you to make sure that you're okay. It doesn't require a formal vote, but we do want to make sure that we get your feedback so that we are proceed, uh, proceeding consistent with your direction. So Kenneth Ritchie from Engineering uh, Services will present. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, as Ruffin stated, I'm Kenneth Ritchie. I'm the Roadway Design and Construction Manager with Engineering Services, and I'm here to provide an update on the Atlantic Avenue widening project. So this project is being designed by our design consultant team with AECOM. And, excuse me, and the project location is Atlantic Avenue, and this is the section from Highwoods Boulevard to New Hope Church Road. Uh, this is just a little bit of area scope to kind of put in context uh, some number of initiatives that are underway, both with the city and with NCDOT. Um, as you can see with the, the green, which are some of the DOT initiatives, uh, certainly as was uh, reported to you back in April by the Department of Transportation, the CSX rail crossing at New Hope Church Road, that project has been delayed some given the uh, current DOT financial situation. Um, with regards to some of the city initiatives, uh, the city did just complete the resurfacing on Highwoods Boulevard as well as on Atlantic Avenue, south of Highwoods down to Six Forks. Uh, the New Hope Church Road widening project is currently underway and planned for completion in the spring of 21. And then certainly this Atlantic Avenue project. The other piece uh, to highlight is an ongoing capital sidewalk project that we are in the midst of designing uh, along Capitol Boulevard uh, that we plan to have going to construction next spring. So Atlantic Avenue, the current existing conditions for this corridor, it's a four-lane undivided roadway with sidewalk on one side, the east side. That's a five-foot wide sidewalk currently. Uh, with regards to some of the background on this corridor, uh, the existing uh, volumes at the time that our traffic study was done and certainly during the times that this was under consideration for the 17 bond was roughly 28,600 vehicles per day. Uh, that certainly, based off of uh, assessments, puts it at around the 97% uh, of the theoretical capacity for that roadway. Um, and during that consideration for the 17 bond, uh, this corridor did rank fourth out of the 62 projects considered, um, and that high rank was based off of uh, its congestion, uh, history of bicycle crashes, and the cost effectiveness of the project. So the purpose of this project is really to improve safety, mobility, and access for all users, um, and really seeks to help implement portions of the wake transit and bike rally plans. Uh, as we'll get to with some of the design elements, we are planning on installing uh, transit pads uh, for future shelter locations, as well as a 10-foot multi-use path on the west side of Atlantic Avenue. This project does have some challenges. Uh, this is a very narrow existing corridor with some severe topography and vertical curvature throughout. There is an existing 30-inch water line through this corridor that is currently about three feet on average in most places under the, under the current roadway. And typically, we do run into challenges with, with private utility relocation. So the proposed scope and design, uh, the budget as set forth with the 2017 bond was 11.6 million. Our projected cost is right now at about 11.1 million. Uh, this, the cross section we are looking at for this project is a four lane divided avenue. Uh, with the addition of the median, that will allow us to provide some pocket left turn lanes, which will help move some of those turning movements out of the, uh, through traffic lanes, helping to uh, increase the safety through the corridor. And then certainly, as I alluded to earlier, we are looking at adding a 10-foot multi-use path on the west side uh, as part of the uh, bike rally plan. One of the areas of concern, given some of the uh, topography and vertical challenges on this project, is at Ingram Drive. Uh, currently, it is it does have accommodations for for all movements, uh, but certainly, given some of the challenges of that topography, there is a history of crashes at this uh, intersection. Uh, in terms of the crash history throughout this corridor, the Ingram Drive intersection does have the highest crash rate uh, throughout the corridor from Highwoods Boulevard to New Hope Church Road. Um, and so what we're looking at doing to try and alleviate some of those concerns is we will be raising the vertical profile about four feet to improve sight distance. Uh, we are proposing a dedicated left turn from Atlantic onto uh, Ingram. And during construction, there will be some temporary widening on the west side just to maintain traffic flow through the area. 
Some additional improvements throughout this corridor, we are looking at a signalized intersection at Bramer Drive. Uh, with, that in, with that signalization, we will also have pedestrian crossing amenities. Uh, transit stops, so we will be installing the concrete pads for future transit shelters. Uh, we will be working through the cul-de-sacs to upgrade water services and resurface those cul-de-sacs. And there will be a public art element to this project that we are currently working with the selected artists for. Another element that we're trying to include with, with all of our projects, and certainly with this one, is green stormwater infrastructure. We have four proposed bioretention cell locations along this corridor. Uh, there are two uh, located at uh, the location shown here across from LeMay Court. Uh, Wainwright Court across from there will be another location. And then across from the uh, entrance to the Arbor's office complex, uh, we will have some other uh, another bioretention cell. Certainly trying to reduce our nitrogen into Marsh Creek, and uh, certainly we tried to find as many locations as we could, but certainly the corridor had limitations on that. So part of our process is, is engagement with the public and certainly gaining feedback from the, the corridor users and residents along these corridors to make sure that these projects do help benefit the community. Some of the feedback we've gotten during those public engagements has been with the, regards to the multi-use path lacks connectivity. Uh, certainly there are future plans with the bike rally plan to extend that multi-use path south underneath the, the bridge and to tie into the Crabtree Creek. Uh, the the, certainly concerns with regards to wider lanes, medians that may increase some travel speeds. While there may be some travel speed increases, uh, moving a lot of those turn lane, turning movements out of the through lanes will certainly help to alleviate a lot of the rear end crashes that we have been experienced. And widening the lanes to a typical 11 foot lane will help alleviate some of the potential for some of the side swipe crashes that are also uh, noted in this area. And then certainly uh, the Ingram Drive intersection, uh, has. there's been numerous feedback on that. Um, and they, the neighborhood does prefer a full access, but certainly the, the vertical curvature in that area uh, does make that uh, a safety concern, even with raising it four feet, uh, given the site distance. And certainly we're trying to promote access into Ingram uh, from Atlantic, but certainly any access out um, and south on Atlantic would need to go out to Brentwood, potentially to New Hope Church. Uh, we are looking at signal upgrades at Brentwood and New Hope Church that would have a protected left turn uh, as part of that signal cycle. So this is kind of a layout of our project schedule, um, and this does kind of follow our typical project delivery schedule. Um, not noted on here would have been the the enactment of this project with the FY19 budget, so part of the uh, budget adoption in July 2018. Uh, our first pre-designed public touch point was in April of 2019. Uh, we then had our early design touch point in October of 2019. Uh, earlier this year in May, we we had our first, or our advanced design public touch point. Um, and this was done with our kind of new strategy given the impacts of COVID-19 where we've, we've gone to more of a social engagement, but certainly with this, we did make ourselves available to questions and to setting up times to meet with residents to, or to meet virtually or over the phone with residents to speak through any concerns they have. Um, as noted on here with the STAR, this is the, the council presentation today. Um, from here, we will move forward with uh, property acquisition. We anticipate completing that in the late spring of 21, where we'll advertise for bids and then move to construction. And we anticipate completion of this project in the late spring of 23. So that's all I have at this time. Are there any questions? Thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Cox? Yes, I wanted to ask about the multi-use path. Um, is, is that a definite? It sounded to me like maybe you weren't sure. No, the, the, uh, the design does have a 10-foot multi-use path that will be constructed along the west side. Okay, and, and you mentioned public art. How much are we allocating for public art for this project? Uh, I, I believe that it was 1% that was allocated for public and, art. And what would that come to in do terms of dollar? I can't remember that exact number, uh, but certainly we can get that for you. 
Yes, if you could. Okay, Councillor Melton and Councillor Bufkin. Yeah, I just wanted to say that if you were looking for feedback, I think that if we are going to invest in a um, street widening project, I think doing it to create more people oriented spaces and spaces for pedestrians and cyclists is the way to do it. So I think that this is great. Um, and I hope that it will improve connectivity in other areas of the city. So thank you. Councilor Bufkin. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I, I concur in uh, Council Member Melton's assessment here. Um, and to put perhaps a little more local flavor on it, uh, Atlantic and Litchford forms the boundary of, for most of its part, is the boundary of between District A and District B. This uh, this road, a lot, uh, uh, we asked this roadway, this corridor to do a lot of work for us. Um, and in some places, it looks like a country road uh, with no curb and, uh, you know, ditches uh, that, that are three or five feet deeper than the roadway. And th this is just such a needed project. And I'm, I'm excited to see it moving forward. Uh, but I would um, challenge us to keep going. Uh, the connection of that multi use path under the Beltline and down to the Crabtree Creek Trail and all the activity that's happening down around Atlantic and Whitaker Mill. Uh, this is a real opportunity for us to link up these parts of the city in a way that is, as Councilor Melton said, uh, more pedestrian friendly and more emphasis on giving folks an option other than a car. So uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, appreciate the opportunity to make some remarks in support. I think judging from all the head nodding, I see people are, ex the council members are excited about this and in agreement on the pedestrian friendly nature and also the ability to ride bikes, the connectivity, all of those pieces are very important. Also wanna say that the public art piece will really, I think, add, um, add to this um, corridor. So thank you. Any other comments? Oh, Councillor Knight. Um, is there a plan for future um, continuing this on south on Atlantic um, in another phase or, or a different scope? Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any current programming for any future widening south, uh, but certainly we can coordinate with the Department of Transportation on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next we have the Barwell Road Park Playground Bid Award in Carolina Panthers Partnership, which is why I have this on. Thank Steve Bentley. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Stephen Bentley with Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources is here to announce the bid award and the partnership that has been successful in helping raise money for the project. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council. My name is Stephen Bentley. I'm one of the assistant directors in the Raleigh Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Department. With me today, I have one of our partners from the Carolina Panthers. Riley Fields, who is Director of Community Relations, and he'll have a part of the presentation as well. Some partners that are not present are our partners with Cunningham Recreation, as well as the project manager for our department, Dean Perry, who has done a lot of the legwork for this. In 2019, we were, let me wait for the slide here. Great. Thank you. In 2019, we were approached by the Carolina Panthers for a possible partnership. We looked at sites all across the city, and for several reasons, we landed on Barwell Road. Some of those reasons uh, exist because there's a, an existing elementary school, so great access to kids. We also have a great community center there. One of the driving forces was that there is a lack of play amenities in that area as seen by this map. Furthering that is that there's a lot of growth in the area. There's two developments adjacent to the park, which is Quarry Trace Apartments and the Barwell Park subdivision, as well as Old Town. This is a, uh, the overview of the master plan for Barwell Road Park. 
On the eastern side, or the left-hand portion of your screen, the front portion of the park actually calls for a very active play in the elements with fields and courts. The center of the, the, the park itself focuses on learning and education through our community centers and our relationship with the Wake County Public School System. And on the right-hand side of the park calls for passive recreation and a future connection to the Noose River Greenway. This is the, the proposed project location. It actually has three components. It has a fairly typical playground, which I'll go over in a little bit. We're grading an area for an open space field. And then the challenge course that we'll talk a little bit more about today. I'm going to ask Riley to come up and talk about the Carolina Panthers partnership with the city of Raleigh. Riley has uh, several years of experience in a lot of these projects underneath his belt, so I'm, he can shed some light on the experiences he's had today. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and um, thank you, Mayor, Mayor Baldwin and uh, council members for uh, providing uh, a few minutes uh, of your time this afternoon for us to uh, share this uh, exciting partnership and that's going to provide a, a great new community resource for District C and will also, uh, I think, serve the, the broader community. Um, youth Health and Wellness has been um, a key initiative of the Carolina Panthers really since the team's inception. And uh, the past 10 years, the NFL's Play 60 initiative has given us uh, a, a great platform uh, to promote that um, that area of focus. And if you're not familiar with uh, the NFL Play 60 program, it, uh, at its core, really, it encourages kids to get 60 minutes of daily physical activity uh, to to develop, you know, healthy, active um, habits that will really last a lifetime. And so, uh, about nine years ago, um, to support that effort, we, we started imagining the opportunity to create a new type of play space that would would challenge kids in in new and in creative ways. And uh, with that, we were looking at um, that age group of kids that once they age out of a traditional tot playground, and, and I think if you've got children, you've experienced it, once your, your children maybe get to that six or seven years old, uh, historically they, they may outgrow those traditional playgrounds. So we were looking at something that could really fit the gap in that need to serve maybe that age group of kids eight to 12. And um, what we've discovered with the development of the Play 60 Challenge course is while it, it does serve that group, uh, younger kids are drawn to it, older kids are drawn to it, um, parents engage with it. And so I think that's been one of the most gratifying uh, aspects of these projects that we've been involved with is that it really um, engages the entire family in a broad spectrum of, of ages. Um, you know, we wanted to create something that provided, you know, active, safe play and uh, promotes creative play and physical activity. And, and I think one of our under underlying um, compasses that we, we always have thought about is creating an opportunity that lets kids understand and realize that using their body is a joy uh, and, and not a chore. And so um, uh, with that in mind, uh, we, we, we endeavored to create uh, the type of play space that we're going to share here in just a few minutes. But, but also, uh, historically, th these projects have not, have not happened uh, without great partners. And so we've had the good fortune to partner with um, Mecklenburg County, uh, uh, with the city of Spartanburg in South Carolina, and and now the opportunity for Carolina Panthers Charities to provide uh, funding that will assist uh, Raleigh Parks Recreation and Cultural Resources is just really e exciting to us. And so, uh, wanted to just talk a, a little bit about um, the the project itself. So, uh, ne next slide, please. Um, th these are a couple of photos from um, some of our existing projects, so one with the city of Spartanburg, one at Freedom Park in Charlotte, and one at Hornet's Nest Park that's uh, also in Mecklenburg County. And what one of the other guiding principles, I guess, when we were uh, creating these this concept was what is going to attract kids? What's going to appeal to those older kids? And we, we stumbled on the, the concept of NFL Combine meets Ninja Warrior. And uh, so with, with that being kind of our, our concept, it, it really helped to, to drive us to uh, create what we think are, are unique and engaging play spaces. Um, 
the, the, the photos along the bottom where you see some, some kids uh, engaged in some of the individual elements, um, I think speaks to one of the things that we like about it most. It, the, these courses and, and play spaces allow kids to do it their own way. Um, if you've got 10 kids, they may use this course 10 different ways, and I think it allows kids, when you get back to talking about creative ways to problem solve or, or um, uh, conquer an obstacle, uh, that's, that's really been um, one of the, the hallmarks of the, the projects. The other thing that uh, I'm really excited about when we finally get the chance to do the ribbon cutting and we let kids take the course, something that you'll see, no, that's wrong, something that you'll hear is the sound of it, and um, it's it's not just the laughter and hey mom watch this. It's the huffing and puffing, the, like the sweating that goes on, like kids really engaging hardcore in in active play and using their bodies. And um, so I think uh, that's something that you can look forward not only to seeing but hearing uh, when when we're able to to finally do uh, the the ribbon cutting. But uh, if we go to the n next slide, please, and I'll let Stephen talk about this. I'm just going to cover very briefly, this is the overall site plan. So it's three components. You have a, a, a mowed lawn area that we're, we're grading out and planting grasses, so we hope to have gatherings and other physical activities. We have a traditional two to five year old play area, um, all uh, poured in place safety, serving, safety surfacing, a five to 12 year old um, play space, and then of course the challenge course. <clears throat> This is just a rendering of uh, the 2 to 5 and 5 to 12. We have swings, slides, uh, shade, which has become really a, a predominant design feature in most of our playgrounds, and of course the, uh, the port in place feature, which reduces maintenance and is much more safer than uh, the mulch surfacing. I'm going to turn it over to Riley so he can uh, speak to our design. Um, he's, as you he mentioned, he's done three of these courses, and this is the specific rendering for Barwell Road Park. Thank you, Steve. One, one of the great parts of this project is being in on the ground floor uh, in, a, in a master plan capacity uh, versus trying to fit um, into a pre-existing space. So I think that's one of the things that's been most exciting uh, about this project. So if you'll, you'll look at the course, um, some of the key elements, you'll notice uh, there's a 40-yard dash and it has an automated timing device so kids can just press a button, then go and then get their time. And what is great about that, if a kid is gonna do that once, he's gonna do it three times, he's gonna do it five times, he's gonna do it seven times, and then dad's gonna get involved. And um, so uh, that's something, again, we've just had so much success with, um, uh, with, with some of our other projects, and I think that's certainly one of the, the unique signature elements. But then when you get into the, the I'm gonna call it the obstacle course itself, because it, it, is, a, a, it is an obstacle course, but it's designed so that children can engage at long form. They can start it to go through the start, go through the, the whole course and finish, or they can play on individual elements within the obstacle course. So it provides that level of flexibility for kids to do it long form or short form if there are particular elements that they, they really enjoy. It also includes a timing device there so kids can time themselves if they wish to do that uh, when, they, when they go through the course. And then there's some standalone elements that offer uh, another element of um, fun and engagement. There's a, a pep talk station. Uh, originally I used to call it a pep talk jukebox, but I know that kids don't really know what a jukebox is, so we changed jukebox to station. Uh, but it's an opportunity where they can um, press a button and receive a positive affirmation, um, uh, just a, a brief audio message that's a positive affirmation from uh, a Panthers player. And there'll be a whole host of these sound bites um, that they'll get to enjoy. So there's a lot of variety and a lot of different positive messaging that, that kids will be able to push play and, in a sense, directly interact with, uh, with some of their favorite Panthers players. And then another great feature is a, a photo booth. And it's, it's sort of a non-traditional photo booth, but it really uh, provides 
a fantastic opportunity for kids and families to capture uh, their day at the park, um, capture a fun together image that they can also share on uh, social media. So with, when you talk about the combination of individual elements, um, a lot of ways to, to participate uh, actively and then other ways to uh, share experiences uh, between kids and, and, and within family members uh, you know, we just we're, we're really excited uh, to be able to partner with um, uh, the city to to bring this new amenity to Barrow Road Park. And I'd, I'd like to close just by saying um, it's been such a a joy, a pleasure uh, to work with Raleigh Parks and Cultural Resources Department. It's just been a tremendous partnership, and they've really made the whole project, the whole process. It's been fun. It's been a joy, and I think now we're at that point where uh, the anticipation of it becoming a reality and getting out there and serving the community is it's right at hand and so I uh, just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to engage in this partnership and um, do something meaning, meaningful for uh, the Raleigh community so thank you thank you Riley just a couple of more nuts and bolts the schedule for the project is subject to your approval today there is um, a couple actions that will be on the last slide uh, we propose a notice to proceed in October and uh, hopefully a, a ribbon cutting in the spring this uh, the funds for this project come from the uh, Parks Recreation and Cultural Resource Department CIP adopted CIP um, on your agenda today is an action for the grading portion of the project um, I talked about about Game Time Cunningham Recreation. They are our vendor, which is providing the recreational equipment and installation of it at a, a discounted rate. So the overall project budget is about $1.36 million. So the three actions that we'll ask you to consider today is to award the bid to Hindsight Work in the amount of $593,930, accept the generous donation from the Carolina Panthers and authorize the city manager to execute a, a donation agreement, and then approve a budget amendment for $150,000. And with that, we can take any questions. I just I just want to share this. I don't know if you can see, but it's the check. $150,000 donation from the Carolina Panthers to um, help fund this project. Extremely generous. the awkward moments of virtual meetings. But I just wanna say thank you. This um, is huge. I love the way you describe this. Um, the age groups that we'll be reaching, very needed. So I um, wanna thank the Carolina Panthers um, for their donation. I wanna thank our Parks Department for um, all the work that you've done. And it's also great to hear when somebody um, says how great um, our team was to work with. Um, that's, that's awesome. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to um, um, acknowledge Councilor um, Branch, Mayor, or Mayor Pro Tem. Um, he lives minutes from this park. And I know, I know that this is going to mean a lot to the community. I know you probably have a couple of things you want to say. Definitely, thank you, Mayor. And, and this does mean a lot. Um, I remember when I was first elected to council, there was a conversation with the community about a master plan uh, for Barwell Road Park. And to now see we're going from the idea of working on that master plan to the, with things going, you know, as, as well as planned, to opening the first phase of this in spring of next year um, is tremendous work and it's only done through partnerships. And I wanna thank the Carolina Panthers for you know being there and stepping in. Um, one thing we always push our staff to do is find partners, find opportunities because you know the city cannot do it by ourselves. And this is an investment in the community of Raleigh, um, in Southeast Raleigh, and I just wanna say thank you on behalf of those citizens that, and I also so want to thank those citizens that worked hard on that master plan. 
um, having meeting after meeting and coming together. Um, and now you're seeing that work and those hours come into fruition um, at this time. There's many more um, work, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, this is just the first phase, but I look forward. And if there aren't any other questions from any counselors, I move for approval of the award, the grant, and the construction contract. Do I? I'm, I'm not surprised that you made the motion. Um, so who would like to second it? Um, Councillor Fort. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Of course not. Thank you. That passes unanimously, Clerk. Um, Riley, I want to thank you again. When I met you earlier, I couldn't see your face because we all had masks on. So it's it's nice to um, to kind of put a face with the name. And um, also, again, just want to thank you for everything that you've done to make this possible. Thank you. And thank you, Mayor. Um, and good luck um, with the six and open. I guess on September thirteenth. The winning starts then. <laughs> well, I think we won today, so thank you. It's nice to have happy news, right? Okay, the next item on the agenda. These are matters scheduled for public hearing. First item is the street closure um, STC 4 2020 unnamed right of way adjacent to South New Hope Road. Good afternoon, Council. I have a couple slides to give some background if Council wants to see them or. Oh, you've muted. So, uh, Madam Mayor. Yes. I, I know this, if, if I'm correct, this street closure is a stub from, for the Old Town project um, that is currently there. I know the master plan in the um, development of this project, there's a new alignment for the street and this closure is required um, in order to move forward. So um, I know we have to have the public hearing, we have the open and close, but I wanted to give that background information. Okay, um, if it's okay with staff, we, we are familiar with this. I'm going to open the hearing. Um, I don't believe we have anyone who signed up to speak. Beth? Mayor, that's correct. There's no one, there's no one signed up to speak for this item. Okay. I will then close the public hearing. Um, Council Branch, would you like to? Yes, I, I move for, let me make sure I don't have any other statements I need to read. Okay, um, I move for approval um, of this street closure. Yes, City Attorney. Um, one, uh, one other thing, it should have, I should have caught this, just move for approval in accordance with the terms in Exhibit A. I move for approval um, in terms of describing Exhibit A. <laughs> what she said, right? Do I have a second? Councillor Fort? Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Clerk, that passes unanimously. The second item um, is public nuisance abatement property liens, um, 601 Church Street. That item has been withdrawn and is being handled administratively. The third item we have is the petition annexation at 3231 Old Millbrook Road. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council, Christopher Golden with Planning Development. Uh, we have the first item uh, for Old Millburn Road, District C, 55.78 acres. Uh, the petitioner would like to hook up to city utilities, water and sewer for the purpose of building 165 single family homes. Um, water and sewer is available just across uh, in Buffalo Road and just to the south of the, the development. And we have slides available if you have any questions. Um, Councilor Branch, do you have any? No, I don't have any questions. Okay. 
Um, why don't we do just a very brief um, overview, if you wouldn't mind? Sure, absolutely. Uh, if we could have uh, slides available, and I will go over that. Thanks. It's actually, uh, this one is Old Milburnie, and there we go. So uh, if you're looking at the property here in District C, the property is 55.784 acres. It's contiguous with satellite corporate limits. It's within Raleigh's ETJ. Um, the, the site is owned R6, conditional use. There is a subdivision plan for the property, S6318. Uh, sewer service is present in Oakberry Drive to the south, which if we go to the next slides, I can show you exactly where that is. Uh, there we go. Okay, so here you see the utility location. The blue line to the south in Buffalo Road is where you see the water, and the sewer is available just across the road in that single family subdivision across the street. Uh, the current zoning is R6CU. Uh, you'll see around that it's, uh, there are also other single family homes in the area. Uh, it is not in a floodplain. Um, it does have some topography to it, but it's not level, but it's also not incredibly steep, except on the north end of the property. Um, you can see the street view, and that'll give you an idea of what it looks out, it looks like there. And um, that's it on Old Mill Bernie. If you have further questions, uh, I can answer them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to open the public hearing. We have no one signed up to speak, so I will close the public hearing. Um, and do I have a motion to approve this? Um, Councilor Branch has made the motion to approve. Um, As described in Exhibit A. Uh, and this time it's in the agenda materials. With each one of these, you would just yeah. to approve in accordance with the agenda materials. So it's a little better. We'll get. We'll, we'll do better next. <laughs> Okay, do I have a second? Councillor Fort, we're putting her to work on her first council meeting. Okay, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, um, clerk, that passes unanimously. The next item is another petition annexation. It's 6611 Paint Rock Lane. Thank you. That's in District C. Uh, the residential annexations continue. Uh, it's 11.25 acres. We have slides for that as well. Uh, the petitioner would like to hook up to water and sewer, both on that property, uh, looking to construct 47 single-family homes in the R6 zoning district. Uh, it's the phase four of the Johns Point subdivision. So two and three have already been completed, and they're looking to fill in um, the remaining phases of their property. They're, it's contiguous. It's inside the ETJ as well. Uh, there is water and sewer available to the east and west. Uh, on opposite sides, you have the other subdivision, so they would connect into this area to build those homes. Um, and we do have slides. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Okay, this is District, District C. Um, District C as well. Council yeah. Pitt. Yeah, you can go ahead with the public hearing. This is basically completing a um, subdivision project. Okay. We have no one signed up. I will open the public hearing and I will close the public hearing. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve? Councilor, I move, for, I move for approval as outlined in the agenda. Okay, would anyone like to second? Oh, Councilor Ford again. Okay, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Clerk, that passes unanimously. And next we have petition annexation at 5501 Spring Forest Road. Correct, correct. Thank you. That's in District B. Uh, this is residential as well. It's a little bit different. It's 11.2 acres. It's also contiguous inside the ETJ. The petitioner would like to hook up to city utilities as well, water and sewer. Uh, but in this case, it's 164 unit multifamily development for affordable senior housing. Uh, the current zoning on that is CX3, which is commercial mixed use, three stories. Uh, it's parkway frontage with conditional use. Uh, sewer and water is available to the 
south and east of the, the property line, uh, and also in Lewisburg and on Spring, uh, Spring Forest Road. Uh, there is also sewer available on the northwest. We have slides for that as well if you have additional questions. Councillor Cox? Yeah, I have no additional questions. Okay. I believe we have Natalie Britt from DHIC has signed up to speak. Beth, do we have Natalie on the phone? Yes, Mayor, we do. Okay. I am going to open the public hearing and um, we'll hear from Natalie. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. And I, I really just signed up in case anyone had any questions or wanted to ask about the project. Um, but yeah, we're already underway with design and looking forward to providing a new affordable housing option for seniors in Raleigh. Okay, does anybody have a question? There are no questions. I, th I think though that there's a lot of people anxious to support this. <laughs> for your good work, um, continued good work, I should say. Um, if there's nothing else, I will close the hearing and I will ask for a motion to approve. Yeah, I'll make that motion. Uh, I'm happy to make the motion to approve in accordance with the agenda materials. Okay, do we have a second? Councilor Branch has seconded that. Councilor Fort, he just beat you out. So um, anyhow, we have um, the motion in a second. All in favor? Anyone opposed? No. Thank you D um, to DHIC. This is going to be a great project. Okay, next we have the report and recommendation of the Economic Development and Innovation Committee. Um, Councilor Melton. Yeah, no report, but our next committee meeting is next Tuesday, the 25th of August. It's at 1.30. It's a vir virtual meeting, and we're going to continue our discussion on our strategic plan um, initiatives. And that's all I got. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Next is the um, report and recommendation of the Growth and Natural Resources Committee. Yes, um, new report. We will be meeting next Tuesday as well, August 25th from 4 to 5.30. We're going to meet a little longer than we usually do um, to cover two items. One is the strategic plan review, and the second is the uh, UDO Chapter 9 Natural Resource Protection, and that will also be a virtual meeting. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, um, the report of the, in, of the Safe, Vibrant, and Healthy Community Committee. Um, we will be meeting at 11.30 on Tuesday. Um, we will have two items on the agenda. One will be the strategic plan review, and the other will be the item that we um, referred there today related to the tax change for outdoor, um, outdoor seating. Okay. And then we have the report and recommendation of the transportation transit committee. Yes, we will meet on August the 27th, Thursday at three o'clock virtual. It'll be a virtual meeting. We'll be um, hopefully closing out um, our micro mobility scooter report. Uh, we'll be discussing our strategic plan review and um, we will be looking at the overlay district. We may not report out on that one at the time, but we will ha have a discussion on those three and that'll be all. Okay, thank you so much. All right, now we have the report of the mayor and city council. I'm gonna start with Councillor Bufkin. Thank you, Mayor and uh, members of council. Welcome back from our summer break. It's uh, good to be getting back to work and uh, officially for the first time, welcome to council member Ford. Look forward to working with you. Enjoyed uh, ch talking with you already. Uh, the hour's late, so I'll be brief. Uh, in my report today, I want to first announce a District A town hall will be held on September 28th. That's a Monday evening at 7 o'clock. We're going to conduct that meeting by Zoom, and more details will follow in the coming weeks. Uh, secondly, uh, Mayor and members of Council, I want to report that we had a serious crash between a uh, pedestrian at Shelley Lake and people on bicycles. Um, and I'd like to ask the staff uh, to uh, look into it and provide council a report on the incident and some recommendations for establishing a public process that 
would have the goal of identifying and implementing measures to improve pedestrian safety at Shelley Lake Park. Um, I've been involved in several rounds of discussions about this, um, and I think it's time to uh, take a second and more serious look at these issues of conflicts between uh, particularly pedestrian and bicycle users. Um, so I um, ask the council, uh, uh, the council support of that and, and would appreciate um, hearing from our staff on that. Okay, thank you. Lastly, I have one more, one more. I just wanted to note that in our uh, consent agenda item, we approved two items that very, very important to North Raleigh, no, no action needed. I just wanna thank you for your support and call those matters to your attention. First, we have authorized staff to uh, grant an easement to install electrical service at the new comfort station at Shelley Lake Park. And that was a uh, 2013 bond project. So we're all, uh, all us fans of Shelley Lake are looking forward to that new amenity. Um, and secondly, uh, the authorization for condemnation authority uh, to complete the workaround on structure 106. This, this bridge has on our greenway on the Crabtree Creek Trail has been out for uh, a little over two years. Um, it's, a, it's the most complicated greenway repair project I've ever encountered in my, in my years working on these types of issues. And um, it has uh, severed a critical link between West Raleigh and, and North Raleigh on one hand and East Raleigh. And so we're all looking forward, uh, all us Greenway users and fans and future Greenway users are looking forward to having that repair done. And I appreciate the staff uh, expediting that matter uh, in, uh, to the extent they're able. Um, so that's my report. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Next is Councillor Knight. Thank you. Um, just want to say, yeah, uh, welcome back to everybody. Um, uh, hope folks had a, a good short break, but I think everybody stayed pretty busy. So it's good to see everybody. Look forward to working, uh, going forward, working hard, and want to welcome aboard as well, uh, Councilor Fort. Look forward to working with you. Um, one thing I do plan on having a listening session coming up tentatively for next Wednesday, um, and I'll put more information out about that as that comes together, just to let you know that. And uh, that is all I have for right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Councillor Cox. Yes, I want to echo welcoming everyone back and also welcoming Stormy to the City Council. It's great to have you here. Um, I also want to mention that uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, I retired last October. And uh, I didn't know that was a, something that was contagious. But uh, I want to take a moment and um, uh, congratulate uh, the city manager. I'm making a decision um, that I think he won't regret. Uh, there is life after retirement. And I wish you all the best uh, going forward. That's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our Mayor Pro Tem. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for being patient with us as we go through these long meetings um, virtually every um, couple of weeks. Um, welcome back, council members. Um, Councilor Fort, um, I have to get used, I'm used to saying Stormy, so I have to get used to Councilor Fort. I just want to say welcome. I'm glad to have you and I look forward to working with you as our two districts have a lot in common. Um, in which we will be partnering on and working together. Um, I will be, I used to have a lot of District C meetings before COVID-19 every month. I'm looking to come back with virtual meetings um, in September, possibly September 19th. Uh, more information will come forth um, to everyone. Um, over the summer, um, a lot of times we talk about how do we work with our youth and empower our youth. Um, the city often gives out impact grants and people say, well, where does that money go? What does that money do? Well, one of those grants went to the social economic and vitality partnership that the city and the county has. Um, also an organization called District C, um, as well as um, Black Dollar and um, others have received funding. But over this past summer, 13 young people participated in a week long empowerment, entrepreneurial and social invest innovation, um, pretty much boot camp. Um, these young people, you know, work with businesses, they work with um, for, um, fertile ground, 
Um, they had they participated and helped with the Black Farmers Market that was held um, at the YMCA. I mean, this was a chance of these young people really giving back and also in having things instilled in them. And I want to thank our staff for that. And just give you an idea, some of these our young people are talking about starting their own construction company. Um, one wants to open a hospital and multiple hospitals. And one young person already started a yard service and was working their yard service throughout the summer um, while school was out. This is a, these are our young people from Southeast Raleigh, from Raleigh. And I want to commend them for their time. I want to thank all the partners that were engaged and involved. And this is the impact that our dollars play a part. And I would like to challenge our staff to possibly help us highlight more of these ideas and things and let people know where our money, you know, the byproduct of the money that these organizations are using. And this is just one that I wanted to highlight um, today. That, and also, they're doing adults in September. And they're doing 25 adults. Last I talked to them, they had 18 young people, I mean, 18 adults, um, but they're gonna work with 25 and go through the same virtual, this is all virtual um, presentation working on empowering entrepreneurs and society innovation. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Next, we have Councillor Stewart. Hi. <laughs> um, first, I just want to um, well, say hello to Councillor Fort, and we are very excited to have you. Um, but also recognize all of the um, parents and students and teachers and school administrators and staff and our um, colleagues on the school board, um, especially this week. Um, we are all doing our best right now. Um, I see you, <laughs> I feel you, I empathize with each and every single one of you as my two children are upstairs right now trying to be quiet. So um, I just want to say, I hope that everybody can kind of treat each other with some kindness and some patience. Um, as we get through the next two weeks of orientation, um, whatever that looks like in whatever school you're at, and um, also afford yourself the same grace. Um, so that's to start. Um, I also wanted to share that um, over the break just this past week, um, I've been appointed to serve in the House Select Committee on Community Relations, Law Enforcement, and Justice. Um, this is the initiative formed by Speaker Moore to examine North Carolina's criminal justice systems to propose methods of improving police training and relations between law enforcement and its communities. And it will also propose methods of addressing overcriminalization and disparities within the state's criminal justice system to improve public safety. Um, and so I'm humbled to serve both Raleigh and our state in that capacity. Um, and then finally, over the council break, I requested and we received an update in the manager's weekly report on the Community-Wide Climate Action Plan Project. Um, for the benefit of our newer members, as well as the public, it's worth noting that the city has been engaged in and committed to addressing climate change for many years through our Office of Sustainability, the CCAP, and other means. And so on May 21st, 2019, the Raleigh City Council adopted a climate pollution reduction goal for our community of 80% by 2050. And in so doing, council took the work of setting a goal or taking the setting of a goal off of CCAP's plate so they could focus on creating a plan of action. And unfortunately, COVID has kind of slowed that down. And now 15 months after setting a goal, we still don't have a formal plan. Um, but if we can, for just a moment, think optimistically about COVID, we can see that it's teaching, teaching us many things, including that government can take bold and immediate actions to address emergencies. And we know that climate change is indeed an emergency. And as our planet warms and flooding becomes more prevalent, temperatures rise and weather becomes more extreme. COVID has also shown a light on the inequities that exist in our systems, including how communities of color and low income communities are burned, burdened most by pollution. So it's imperative that we act now to mitigate the devastating impacts of climate change and build a more resilient and equitable community. So in understanding the climate emergency that we face and as environmental professionals, Council Member Knight and I will be meeting with staff in the coming weeks to see how we can move faster on our community's plans and what action we can take now. So that's all, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Then we have Councillor Melton. So 
Yes, thanks. Um, I'll again start by welcoming uh, Councillor Ford. I'm also used to saying Stormy, so I'm going to try really hard to use your new uh, title. Um, I just want everyone some personal updates. I had a pretty busy um, council break. My partner and I got engaged, and um, I also had knee surgery. So if you have seen me grimacing at times during the meeting, I assure you it was not in response to comments or presentations. It is because I'm struggling more than normal to get comfortable, um, but I'm pushing through. The only thing I had um, is I know that we have a work session scheduled for September 8th, and one of the topics is pedestrian safety review. And I was wondering if during that work session, we could also receive some information on how the city is prioritizing locations for pedestrian safety. Um, I know that there has been some recent incidents and unfortunate accidents at the Gorman and Avent Ferry crosswalk, and I know that we have plans for a hawk signal there. But I'm wondering what we're doing um, proactively to reduce pedestrian um, fatalities or collision. Um, and I know that we have added the uh, Vision Zero to our um, potential strategic plan. So I think if we could just maybe get an update on how we are prioritizing those types of intersections um, at this work session, if that's appropriate, and if council um, is fine with that. Okay. Councilmember Melton, that, that is the purpose of the presentation. Even so, better. Okay, great. So, you know, I, I think uh, part of the goal is to help educate the council and the public on some of that prioritization and the demands and the needs. And some of that is also resource limited and, you know, yeah. and how the staff does indicate where are the problem areas and where are not. So, yes, I think that uh, we may not have, be able to comprehensively answer and solve all the problems but that the purpose of that is to go over how that works great yeah i just wanted to make sure it was part of the discussion and it sounds like you're already ahead of me and that's all i have so thank you great okay now we have councillor fort good afternoon i just want to thank everybody for all of the assistance as i've transitioned on to the council uh, especially want to thank the staff who's been very, very gracious with their time, uh, helping me get caught up to speed on a variety of issues and policies, uh, and uh, fellow council members who've checked in with me to make sure I'm, I'm uh, you know, up to speed and, and understanding. Uh, you've all been very, very welcoming, and I greatly appreciate it. And uh, I also have to admit I've had a number of constituents from the district that have reached out, and I've been very, very helpful about a number of issues and having conversations and uh, things along those lines. So. I want to thank everyone for being uh, very, very gracious and uh, very supportive as I've transitioned onto the uh, council. And uh, that's all I have today. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Fort, welcome. I also want to tell you that I loved watching you sound the siren at the Carolina Hurricanes game. I like the muscles after it was really nicely done. Um, so thank you for doing that. And speaking of the Carolina Hurricanes, I might have on a Panthers jersey, but um, one of the things I do want to thank the Hurricanes for is a couple of donations that they have made. One um, was to our small business fund. They did an auction that we helped promote, um, auctioning off items um, from Carolina Hurricanes players. They made a um, $20,000 donation of the Small Business Fund. They also made a $10,000 donation to our Compassion Fund, and that will um, help families living in hotels find stable housing. So I just want to acknowledge the um, generosity of the Hurricanes. Yep, that's applaud worthy. And also the um, you know, their efforts um, on and off the ice. So um, thank you um, for all you do and for um, all the work um, and giving back that you do for our community. Um, now, bear with me. I have a couple of things here. Um, number one, I just want to announce that the committee assignments for, um, for Councilor Fort will be um, the Safe, Vibrant, and Healthy Neighborhood Committee and also the Growth and Natural Resources Committee. 
Um, so she will be replacing Councillor Martin on both of those committees. We will be looking at the liaison positions and there might be some shuffling there um, depending on different skills and interest. So um, we will be looking at that. Um, let's see, I want to um, mention a Dix Park Leadership Committee meeting we had. There were some questions about um, the widening of um, Lake Wheeler Road and road improvements there. Um, City Manager, if you could have somebody attend the next um, Dix Park Leadership Committee, just talk about transportation initiatives and um, that would be very helpful. And then we will update um, the city council members on that as well. Good. Certainly, we can do that. Okay. The next thing I wanted to mention was um, an action the county had taken yesterday. Um, we have been talking with the Metro Mayor's um, Coalition about this. And that is, I think all of you know, we are going to have a tremendous shortage of poll workers um, for this election. And what the county did yesterday is they going to allow um, their city, I mean, their county employees to take um, leave and work polls on election day. I've asked the um, city manager to look at how we might do this in Raleigh as well um, to ensure that we have adequate staffing at the polls. So if you could bring back um, the, at the September 1st meeting, um, Mr. City Manager, um, a proposal that would be very helpful. And then um, the next item I have relates to conversations I've had it seems over and over the past two weeks about daycare. A lot of anxiety and concern um, out there. I would like to ask our staff, I know this is not normally something that we do, um, but I would like us to ask our staff to look for some creative ways that we might um, assist in this manner. Um, you know, <laughs> this is a workforce issue. But it's also, uh, I mean, if it's going to be difficult for people to come back to work, um, we have to start looking at how we're going to make that happen. We got a major presentation today on um, downtown and efforts to revitalize the downtown. We also heard that many of our major employers are not returning. What can we do to ease the burden when they do return? How do we... Um, how do we assist in this? Um, are there partnerships available? I want us to be creative and I want us to kind of strip off the, the that whole concept of this isn't what we normally do because it's not. But let's look at how we can partner and collaborate. So I'm going to charge the city manager with, um, with taking that um, small cha challenge on. How's that? Um, <laughs> I think he's speaking. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have uh, some questions about, about that assignment, but I uh, will certainly open to the, the discussion that the council would wish to have. Uh, and my hesitation is, is, is scope and, and definition and the potentially resources. So, um, I guess, Mayor, are you requesting a report or would you like to put that on a future agenda? I would like to put it on a future agenda. Okay. It, we, now, take time to think about this. It, I'm not asking for it to be on the September 1st agenda or the, um, the middle of September. Take some time to really think about this. And it, and it could be a work session item too for mid-October. Okay, uh, we will give that some thought and get back to you uh, to work session in October. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to also um, thank um, our city manager for all his hard work over the past seven years. 
um, I didn't want him to leave thinking that I didn't want to challenge him. I know he likes new challenges. So, yeah, deal with the daycare thing, okay? Got it. <laughs> and um, we, we look forward to continuing to work with you through the end of December. And um, thank you for all you've done for our city. Um, what we've achieved the last seven years will have a long and lasting impact. So want, I just want to acknowledge that and thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Okay. All right. Um, the next is appointments. Um, the first item is the Appearance Commission. Um, clerk, are you going? Yes. Are we ready? Yes, we are. Okay, on the Appearance Commission, uh, we do have one vacancy uh, due to a term expiring and the person is not eligible for reappointment. Um, we did outline some information on the Appearance Commission on the agenda about the future of the Appearance Commission and the need at some time in the near future to um, have an appointment from that the county makes uh, of a person on the ETJ. Um, we do have one nomination uh, for, the, for the position and that's by Mr. Knight Carter Needham Muir. And I'm not sure of the address if, if he is a uh, in-city resident or happens to be in the ETJ. Councilor Knight, could you clarify that? Um. If, if you're he not sure, that's okay. Well, we would put it on the next agenda and additional nominations could be made and we could clarify the residence of that particular person. Right. So, he, lives in the, he lives in my district, so I think he's, he's uh, it, yeah, he's inside the city limits. Not the okay. Area. I think his last name is Kenamore. Um, Kenamore, so, okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, so we have, we need to appoint somebody from the ETJ though, correct? It is not necessary at this point, but you do have the ability. The code indicates that the Appearance Commission is one of the boards that you can appoint people outside the ETJ. Um, we have to do a code change and the attorney might need to step in and help me with this. We have to do a UDO change um, sometime within the next six months, I believe it is, Robin. Um, and at that time, we will have to have an appointee from the county. The law, I believe, also indicates that we have to keep the membership at 15. Um, and so one thought was if, if the city has someone that lives in the ETJ and wanted to appoint them at this time, then when the UDO change comes into effect, we would have an opportunity to recommend to the county that they appoint the same person uh, because they are, the county always looks to the city to make recommendations as to who they should appoint to our boards and commissions. Um, I think you do have another chance uh, in in um, March, I believe it is, um, to have another appointee. But uh, we just thought this was a chance to let you know what's coming down the road. And if you wanted to look at an ETJ person, it would be fine at this point. Not required, but would be fine. Okay. So we will continue and put this on the next agenda and see where it goes from there. Okay. okay. All right, the next item is the Substance Use Advisory Commission. You have one vacancy, and we have two nominations on uh, Nicholas Sovak by Ms. Stewart, Councilmember Stewart, and Holly Watkins by Councilmember Knight. So that would be on your next agenda for additional nominations and or vote, whichever. Okay, and that's all we had on your ballot at this time. So we'll go on, <coughs> excuse me, to nominations on the Arts Commission. You have one vacancy. The term of Moses Alexander Green is expiring. He is eligible for reappointment and would like to be considered for reappointment. 
Okay, if there's no action, we'll move on to the second one. Um, uh, is there any action on that, Council, um, Mayor Pertem? Um, I mean, unless someone had a name, um, I, I think he, you know, based on the numbers, I was going to nominate him again. Okay. Would you like to make that motion then? So move for a reappointment of Moses Green. Do we have a second? Um, Councilor Knight. Okay, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Oh, that passes unanimously. Thank you. The next item is the Fair House and Hearing Board. You have two vacancies. The terms of Colin Bober and Sandra Collins are expiring. Both are eligible for reappointment and would like to be considered for reappointment. I will nominate both of them for reappointment. Do I have a second? Councilor Melton, thank you. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. So the two are so the two are reappointed. Yes. The next item is Parks Recreation Greenway Advisory Board. You have three vacancies. The terms of David Millsaps, uh, Claudette Lyons, Baston, and Carol Ashcraft are expiring. Um, Miss Ashcraft is the only one that is eligible for reappointment and would like to be considered for reappointment. So you have three vacancies for consideration. Um, Council Melton. Yeah, I move to reappoint Miss Ashcraft. Do I have a second? Okay. Councilor Cox, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Clerk that passes unanimously. Um, can I just make um, a quick statement here? Um, when considering nominations for the two vacancies, please, actually this applies to all of our boards and commissions, please look at the diversity or the lack thereof of the, the boards. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking just generally, there, there's no Latino um, representation in our Parks and Recreation and Greenway Advisory Board. Um, I don't know if there's any LGBT representation. Um, I just want us to be super conscious of looking at the makeup of our boards and commissions and tr welcoming diverse candidates for um, application. So that's all. And, and along those lines, Mayor, um, we do include in the agenda packet a list of Yep. Each boards and each of the memberships, and it does include information on um, diversity. And and so, if there's anything additional that we could send you to help with that, just let us know. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next so you will have two vacancies on uh, for consideration on your next ballot. Uh, the next item is Raleigh Convention and Performing Arts Center Authority. You have. Um, uh, one vacancy, the term of Derek Quittenbird is, Quittingbird is expiring and he is eligible for reappointment and would like to be considered for reappointment. I'm going to make a motion to reappoint um, Mr. Wittenberg. Do I have a second? So I have a question, Mayor. Uh, I, 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 Councillor Knight second that, so yes. And I'm not trying to be rude but um he's only attended three of the 12 meetings so I, is there can we talk to him or the chair and just make I sure have, that i have already we, spoken to him uh, and also to members of the um i'm the liaison to the raleigh convention and performing arts center so i have done that already great okay 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 you have a motion to reappoint him um but i don't think you voted not, not yet. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Councillor Cox is opposed, so that passes 7-1. Thank you. 
Okay, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the next item is the Raleigh Historic Development Commission. Uh, you received a re letter of resignation from Jimmy Team, and you did s receive in your agenda packet a uh, recommendation from the nominating committee of that group uh, for your consideration, but you do have one vacancy and you do have a recommendation, but of course you're free to nominate anybody you so choose. Council Branch. Um, I move to, um, nom well, I'm nominating Harold Millette, uh, who was nominated by the committee for the Raleigh Historic Development Commission. Do we have so. a second? Councilor Fork has seconded. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously, clerk. And for my uh, uh, clarification, you nominated him or for reappointment, right? You you reappointed him with that motion. Is that correct? He, he actually, I think what happens is he was appointed, Madam Mayor, if I may. Yes. Um, he was appointed. You probably have to put on the next ballot. Um, but he came as a recommendation from the committee because they have a nominating committee. Okay, okay, so we'll put him on the next ballot yeah. and additional nominations could be made. Is that, is that the way we're going with that one? Okay. Well, we just, we just approved him. Yeah, we approved him unanimously, so. Okay, okay. very good, so he is appointed. Yeah. Yes. Okay, very good. Well, um, the next one is the Stormwater Management Advisory Commission. You have one vacancy. The term of David Markwood is expiring. He is eligible for reappointment and would like to be considered. Do we have a motion? Councillor Stewart, do I have a second? Councillor Knight, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. Okay, that is all I have under nominations and appointments. Um, so we're on to the city attorney, okay. <laughs> okay, next we have the report and recommendation of the city attorney. Um, thank you, Mayor. I have one item. Uh, you may remember that at the beginning of the year that you, the mayor, had asked our office to, um, with the framework to um, uh, compile a study group to consider um, the recommendations related to city council terms, city council compensation, and voter engagement and participation. Uh, a decision was made for council to appoint a group of seven city residents um, to the study group. The process was started and people applied and we got some um, applicants, but then COVID-19 hit. And so it sort of took a back seat for a little while. And I think that um, if council's ready to go forward, that we can sort of start that back up again. Um, but because of the things related to the virus, it might be a good idea that you open the process back up for a couple of weeks to make sure that everybody who wanted to apply has the opportunity to do that. You may remember that the process, there's not an application per se, but we had asked that interested persons submit a letter of interest to the clerk along with a resume or a bio. So if um, the council would like to do that, we would suggest that perhaps you reopen the application process and keep it up until September 11th and bring it back to council on October the 6th to get that committee underway. So that's what I have. If there's any comments or questions or council wants to act on that, they could do so. <coughs> any comments? And I, I would suggest that you proceed as you outlined. Okay, um, if the council, we probably need a motion since we're gonna reopen it up, that the council would reopen the process for the application period for the study group until September 11th. Do I have a motion? Councilor Bufkin, do I have a second? Councilor Knight, all in favor? Opposed? Okay. That was unanimous, clerk. 
I'll try to get back by October the the second um, October the sixth, first meeting in October. Okay, thank you. Next, we have the report and recommendation of the city clerk. She's on, she's, on, she's on mute, but it's minutes. I, I move for approval of her minutes. Do I have a second? Councilor Melton? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. I'm through. It works better when I'm on mute. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now I have a motion for closed session. Bear with me. It's a long one. Um, motion is in order to enter closed session pursuant to GS 143 318.1183 to consult with the city attorney to preserve the privilege and to give instructions concerning the handling and a settlement of a potential claim, including Springdale Estates Association versus City of Raleigh, City of Raleigh versus um, Belasco, City of Raleigh, yeah, Belasco, um, Revision um, Board of Adjustment Appeal, um, then GS 143-318-11A5 to instruct the city staff and negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken in negotiating the price and other material terms of a proposed contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease. And finally, GS 143-318-11A6 to consider the qualifications competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer employee or prospective public officer employee. So moved. Do I have a second? Councillor um, Stewart? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously, Clerk. Okay, we will take a five minute break um, and then um, enter into closed session. Please mute yourself and turn off your microphone, I mean, um, your video.
We have completed our closed session. Um, we provided staff with direction on the items that um, were listed on the motion. And I am going to now adjourn the meeting. Thank you.